Good morning, everybody. I think we can all take our seats. Okay, so on behalf of the European Policy Center, I would like to um, welcome everybody um, to this hybrid policy dialogue, which is looking at can economy and trade keep the Eastern Partnership policy afloat. It's a great honor um, for the EPC to be working today with um, Ukrainian PRISM and the Eastern Partnership Civil Society Forum. So I thank very much to um, Hinadi for giving us the opportunity to work together. And I look forward to you know, many other opportunities in the future. I think the topic of today's meeting um, is important because time and time again, you know, in this town and elsewhere, you know, I hear conversation about the relevance of Eastern Partnership. Do we need to keep it um, anymore because of the associated trio? Um, so I think it's important to underline the relevance of maintaining the Eastern Partnership as a sort of regional policy of the EU, because it's something that keeps all the countries um, together. And also the fact that the EU has actually invested a lot economically and politically in this initiative um, for many years now. Obviously, Poland and Sweden, um, the two countries that initiated it in the, in the first place, um, wouldn't want to see it disappear off the map. So personally, I do think there's still some value in maintaining um, this policy. But of course, some of the speakers today might have um, a different view. And that's always the point of these sorts of discussions. But obviously, economic um, cooperation and investment is key to building a strong and resilient, well, not just independent countries, but a region. And that's particularly important at a time like this, um, when Russia's full scale war against Ukraine is still going on. So economic investment and trade in the future is going to be key. Um, I just wanted to make those very short remarks in the beginning, again, to welcome uh, you all, and I'm going to hand the floor now to uh, Hinadi um, to welcome from his side. Thank you. Thank you, dear Amanda, your excellencies, dear friends, colleagues. It is my pleasure that we have this opportunity jointly with European Policy Center to have uh, the final set of our round tables uh, and the, the final one in uh, this the set of five, which is devoted to our core issue, which I think is a backbone for every policy, economy and trade. So uh, our idea uh, of uh, Ukrainian prism was to assess what is now happening to take stock of your Eastern partnership, because from one hand we see maybe some parts of this policy are obsolete, but from other hand, when we listen to communication from our partners from European institutions, they say it is still intact and it is still uh, have um, good baskets of finances and resources to share with our countries. So that's why I think it is very important for us to uh, talk to specialists, to economies, what's going on in this uh, realm of Eastern partnership and to assess how far we can go with our implementation of programs and initiatives within the economic pillar of uh, Eastern Partnership. With this, I would like also once again to thank you to European Policy Center. Uh, we joined recently uh, the network of uh, this brilliant organization. And I think this, the first our joint event, but I think this is not the last. So thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to our great discussion. Thank you so much. So maybe with no further ado, we give a uh, floor to our moderator, Veronika Mouchan. Veronika, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, dear friends, dear colleagues, uh, everybody who are now in this room and also everybody who is listening uh, online, welcome today to our event. It's a hot summer day, so great that you joined us instead of going somewhere uh, which is maybe cooler, nicer, or something like that. So, but it's very important, and I'm really, really pleased to see so many uh, faces here, just even physically. 
Today we have two great sessions. First one will be like more official. Second one will be expert level. And the first one is covering the very important topic of trade and economic integration in the Eastern Partnership, new ambitions for the candidates trio. And I'm thrilled that we have here three heads of the missions of three, uh, three countries um, just from Closer to me, I apologize if I pronounce wrongly, but Bakhtang Mah um, Maharablishvili. Very good. Perfect. Mm -hmm. I did it. Sorry, I really no. apologize. I, I should have trained. It's a very common. <laughs> but mm -hmm. still. And then who is uh, heading the mission of Georgia to the European Union? Then the Daniela Morari, who is heading the Moldovan mission, and Sevala Chensov, who is heading the Ukrainian mission to the European Union. And actually, the first question will be to all three of them, how they see Eastern partnership and the accession process. The countries have very limited resources. Uh, there is a like, and each, each process requires efforts, human efforts, capital efforts, time efforts. Are the Eastern partnership and accession, are they like complementary to each other? Or do they compete for the same very scarce pool of resources in our countries, but also in the EU? Because it's if we have many, many tracks, you each of that requires resources to invest to. What is the value of Eastern Partnership now after 2022? Then our countries got either candidate status or, status or prospect of the candidate status. Do we see economy is the opportunity to integrate even further, or do we see that here initiatives are also going in different directions, especially with the war still ongoing and basically Russia precluding many trade links? to happen because we have now the Black Sea is blocked for Ukraine and, uh, and we have no land easy, well, basically no land routes between Ukraine and uh, Caucasus. No, we have one through Turkey, but it's a bit like too long. So how do you assess the process? I suggest that you have each up to 10 minutes and then I very much hope you'll have a lot of questions to discuss. Okay, Bakhtan, let's yes, start with you. Thank you. Uh, many thanks for uh, for <clears throat> inviting us and inviting me. Uh, really happy to, uh, to be part uh, with my colleagues um, uh, to this uh, discussion, because I think it's an interesting topic. This is the topic that, of course, uh, uh, had been uh, on our uh, plate, on our table for the last uh, months and probably more than a year, how we continue with Eastern Partnership. Because, of course, with uh, some of the new realities that had been uh, you know, ongoing, uh, we have to uh, reassess, uh, rethink uh, with regard to this project if we want to ensure that uh, it uh, stays successful, and as a matter of fact, uh, if we want Eastern Partnership uh, to stay alive. I mean, in one word, I would, of course, say that uh, when it was um, created uh, in 2009 by Poland and Swedish initiative, um, of course, it was um, something that we very much embraced because this was kind of an enhanced uh, approach uh, towards uh, uh, Eastern European neighbors uh, of the European Union. And it brought, uh, at least from the Georgian perspective, of course, it had a number of uh, shortcomings, maybe it failed in a number of ways, but uh, in many in, in many directions, uh, we certainly benefited from Eastern Partnership and uh, Georgia said, I mean, I can, of course, speak on behalf of Georgia, and I can say that uh, we have uh, achieved uh, uh, a lot. Uh, also using uh, the framework of Eastern Partnership, which brought us uh, closer to the European Union. Obviously, uh, from the very beginning, we knew it very well. And we we have been told a lot of times that 
Eastern Partnership was about the partnership and not about the membership. Uh, and of course, uh, Georgia, like Ukraine and Moldova, had different and has different ambitions. But obviously, in 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 those circumstances, for us, it was very important to uh, exploit uh, any mechanism, any instrument which could get us closer in any way uh, with the European Union. And of course, Eastern Partnership certainly provided a lot of interesting tools uh, which uh, which uh, helped us uh, in this direction. And uh, even if uh, the the club uh, was uh, pretty eclectic, uh, and when I say eclectic, I mean that uh, some member states, I mean the partner countries um, had an ambition to become members of the European Union sometime in the future some uh, countries had no interest uh, in uh, uh, in 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 eu membership so there was no big idea uniting uh, uh, the 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 countries of the club but uh, there have been a lot of uh, uh, topics uh, sectors uh, uh, which uh, united us in terms of um, getting us uh, closer to the eu for us who wanted to do so and uh, for others to ensure the level of cooperation with other partners but also with the european which they actually aspire to but of course uh, with the current reality um uh, with uh, with uh, you know, with all three i mean the countries who represent here uh getting a clear perspective that we will become uh, an eu member state uh, once we uh, fulfill um, the relevant criteria and requirements and two countries already being a candidate country and hopefully Georgia also joining them and becoming the candidate country. Of course, um, uh, the reality has changed many things. It changed uh, also the fact that uh, Eastern Partnership cannot be a driving mechanism of our relationships uh, uh, with the European Union. Of course, we had the bilateral agreements, we had uh, association agreements, we had deep and compromise and free trade agreements, we, which are called new generation of uh, agreements, which really had been bringing us uh, and EU are key to our legislation uh, in a very high degree. But of course, uh, somehow Eastern Partnership was this umbrella framework from from my uh, standpoint, which, uh, which was kind of a regulating uh, um the, uh, the the big uh, process between uh, the region and uh, and the european union but of course with new reality uh eastern partnership cannot probably at least from our perspective cannot remain to have this kind of a role um uh, because we have really moving in a uh, completely new level of cooperation and i would say of course, integration process, uh, accession process uh, with the European uh, Union. Therefore, if we want Eastern Partnership to remain uh, alive and to remain successful, uh, we want we want to we, we need to be become more creative uh, in terms of finding its role. And certainly, uh, at least from our standpoint, uh, there is uh, there is a resource. There are there are there is a possibility to ensure that. Eastern Partnership uh, remains to be interesting for all partners and also, of course, uh, to the European Union and member states. But we have to seek for various uh, topics and the sectors. And from the Georgian perspective, connectivity uh, is certainly one big topic in that direction because uh, connectivity is the topic which uh, is uh, interesting for uh, for everybody. It is interesting for for European Union, and we all know that very recently, uh, EU has uh, elaborated a big policy called uh, Gateway. Uh, but uh, but of course, uh, even before that, uh, we had TNT. We had uh, we I mean we had a big interest of the European Union to connect our region so in a better way, but also connect our region with the European Union. And from the Georgian perspective, but from the also from the wider perspective, it was also always very much interesting to shrink the distance, physical distance between the European Union uh, and our countries and our region. Therefore, connectivity is uh, definitely uh, a big topic which uh, can unite uh, the whole 
uh, Eastern Partnership uh, and uh, and the European Union. And of course, there are resources also for that because we all know that the, besides TNT, which had been uh, around, and some of the uh, projects that had been uh, on the ground, EU has also introduced the economic and investment plan, uh, which uh, certainly with its flexibility uh, can ensure uh, the not, maybe not entire financing, but certainly participation uh, from the European Union side in, in major projects, which could involve uh, electricity projects, um, digital projects, uh, energy projects. And of course, when I talk about all these various um, elements of uh, transport, energy, digital, uh, telecommunications connectivity, I also mean uh, from the prism of, of the war and Russian aggression right now ongoing uh, in Ukraine, because of course it is important also for the European Union to ensure um, alternative routes by uh, bypassing the uh, Russian Federation. And certainly these regions have been uh, also very much always willing to ensure these uh, alternative routes. And we also see that um, Central Asian countries, even though they are not, of course, members or part of the Eastern Partnership uh, group, uh, they have become more and more interested in uh, in uh, in connecting uh, in this way with uh, with Europe uh, through our regions. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, European Union, I mean, also our countries should facilitate this process. I mean, the EU should also uh, need to become more active and we see more dynamics also in this direction. We see more delegations coming to Brussels from Central Asia, but also from uh, from Brussels going to Central Asian countries also on a very high level. And this is of course uh, very important. I don't want to take um, more time, but certainly maybe in, in more detailed discussion, I, we could also mention some of the already ongoing projects uh, which already connect uh, uh, our part um, with, uh, with, the, uh, with the rest of Europe. And basically our, our region uh, willing and uh, actually also resourceful to contribute to to green energy, to to green green energy bringing to to the to the kind of a rest of uh, European continent, and I think uh, we we can enter in a very very interesting uh, uh, times in that regard. But of course, one one word before I pass the floor: security is very important because you, you, one cannot um, have a trade and economic relations if there is no stability, if the security is not insured. And here I mean not only hard security, which is of course the priority, but also hybrid uh, security. And uh, here, of course, cyber security, disinformation and uh, other means of uh, hybrid uh, warfare is very important. And of course, this could be other areas of, uh, of interest of all Eastern partner countries when it comes to uh, joint, uh, joint uh, projects and joint ventures. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's a great start and talk and my takeaway immediate that we have to be creative and the connectivity is the thing to think about. And we are talking basically about transport connectivity, but also digital energy. So all broad infrastructure, I think as a dimension that could be interesting for the region. Daniela, what is your thinking? Good morning to everyone from my side too. Uh, also very pleased to see such a high interest in a Monday morning in the middle of summer. Uh, I, um, uh, in the same time, congratulate uh, Amanda and Hennady for putting it together. I think it's also important to find time and to sit in order to go into depth in some thematic subjects. And uh, I think it's, it's indeed good. And I think it's very relevant to start of economy and uh, even to, to further develop in different other sectors. Um, in case of the Republic of Moldova, I um, kind of everything we try to do, especially in the last month or the last year, I try to put in three big directions. First is to deliver. Second, what we can do more, especially in the shoes of the candidate country. And the third, I think, which keeps us the most busy is to find solutions to different crises and the impact of the war in Ukraine. Um, and um, 
I would like a bit to go through all three dimensions with a more focus on the economy and trade, which is the topic of the today uh, discussion. Um, of course, uh, we are trying our best to deliver uh, on the nine steps that are in the opinion of the Commission and um, in all the conditionalities that we have uh, in the according to, to the chapters uh, uh, in order to have a solid substance and solid results that will be kind of um, reflected in the re enlargement report in autumn in the Commission side that will allow us to go to the next uh, step, which is the opening of negotiations. This is uh, one of our main priority, and we're working hard towards that. Uh, we're very pleased with the assessment of the oral report, uh, and in the time we also know the road ahead of us and how much still we need to, to do, do in terms of homework to deliver. And everything is focused on that. But in parallel, we're trying also to deliver on everything else. If to talk about the... Uh, Eastern Partnership and Economic uh, and Investment Plan. We're working on the five flagship initiatives. It's some progress uh, on majority of them. Some are more advanced, especially on energy efficiency, on connectivity, um, and uh, on the small medium enterprises. Uh, the one on building on the inland terminal and education, it's kind of lock, uh, work in progress. We're working with EFIs um, and kind of process is ongoing. Uh, a lot of work on the DCFTA, trying to, to deliver and to uh, make more kind of of the potential what DCFTA uh, brings to us. You already know that we have around from 60 to 70, depends on which year we count, 70% of trade uh, from the Moldova goes to the EU, including the Transnistrian region, which makes a big, big difference in a very difficult situation we are now. Uh, in the same time, we are working and trying to see what we can kind of further develop. Uh, and here we are working on homework for the animal region goods. We just um, kind of received the green light for eggs and poultry, processed meat. Now we are working towards fresh meat. The next priority is dairy. And then we'll kind of go step by step to, to, to extend. We're very interested in diversifying and um, in... Um, Kind of really making full advantage of all the opportunities that the CFTA kind of brings in terms of standards and uh, potential. Um, also, we are um, uh, implementing the authorized economic operator. We have the mutual recognition agreement, which is enforced from last year. And we're also trying to share from this experience to other countries which are interested into that. Um, we are... Um, um, very pleased, and it was one of the very important achievements, uh, the voluntary agreement on roaming, and also now working hard on all the um, legislation for Rom like home. And uh, according to me, after the visa liberalization, this is the second with the most direct impact for the citizens that we believe it will happen from 1st of January next year. Uh, this is just a few examples on how uh, and what kind of we're doing in terms of delivering and trying to, to follow on all the commitments on our side. On the second part, which it means what we can do more, uh, we just uh, kind of approve the, we call it roadmap for the safety, but practically it's action plan for the safety, where we're trying to see what we can do more uh, from the safety part. We're also negotiating uh, access to different EU programs. Already we have in place customs and fiscalis, like then we have other, but in different sectors, like you for health, life and, and, and others. But like uh, now we are just finalizing negotiations on the single market program, which we hope to launch beginning of September. Uh, also ongoing negotiations on the Digital uh, Europe program, and we're trying to identify new programs that will make it uh, an added value for, for us. Uh, we're interested in the economic and financial dialogue. We just had the Commissioner Gentiloni last week in Kishina. We're also trying to see how gradually we should prepare for that in order to understand in terms of homework, but also reporting and all, all, what exactly this means. Um, we're interested in the Joint Common Transit Convention and uh, also a lot of homework ahead of us on that. Um, and uh, um, interested in ACA negotiations. We're kind of now in this feasibility kind of uh, stage of identifying sectors and preparing for that. 
um, and uh, trying to identify new tools and instruments to um, have different intermediary yardsticks that will take us to the single market. We really believe that this is the most important and practical and also how gradually we can reach that target. Um, and uh, on the third dimension, which is facing the crises, um, you know that it kept us busy in different dimensions in the last year, like one of the main, it was energy, uh, energy crisis. And uh, now we're also trying to prepare for the next winter uh, and the entire economic sector and also the small medium enterprises who have a few programs uh, on energy efficiency in also both uh, public, but also private sector, and also how to to, to shift and to change and also to, to be resilient to, to that. Um, you know that um, uh, since the, the, the war against Ukraine kind of uh, started, we've been uh, facing all the consequences also, like losing trade with the East, uh, losing all the connections of the global trade because Odessa was the main port that was linking to us. Um, and finding all the alternative solutions, it was kind of inflation and also high prices. And now uh, one of the main priority for the economy is to find new markets uh, and uh, to, to find diversification also solutions, not only for export, but also for imports, because we've been dependent on different types of goods. And um, this is also practically what we're trying to find solutions to. We're working hard on solidarity lanes, also to kind of in the bigger picture for them, finding and facilitating access of uh, grains uh, from Ukraine uh, to, to reach uh, all the markets of the world, uh, but at the same time to find solutions for our farmers and for our grains too, because we're also facing a very difficult uh, kind of situation for, for our agricultural sector. Uh, we've been invited uh, for the this uh, common platform uh, at the level of EU and we're trying to find solutions together. Uh, we're also very uh, kind of grateful for the Moldova support package that was just recently approved by the Commission, also trying to find practical solutions and help uh, um, top up on the macro financial assistance. And uh, also we're interested in finding uh, additional support for small medium enterprises to kind of face the day to day challenges uh, to um, keep afloat uh, and um, um, as you know, uh, our government um, um, just launched two weeks ago, like 20 priorities for the for the current year, where the economy it's uh, one of the um, third kind of the three main pillars, and and economy it's one of of those, and that's why we're trying to find practical solutions uh, on developing economy, on developing the growth, and also to have practical solutions to very difficult difficult sectors we are kind of in. Um, this is a little bit on kind of where we are, and um, we're trying to for every dimension to see on which instrument and which part of the policy of the house could work uh, in. Uh, we are trying to maximize as maximum what we can do from the current instruments, but in the same time to prepare and to take on board as many additional new instruments. We're learning a lot from the Western Balkans in terms of like their process and also the uh, member states, especially the ones which are kind of closer geographically to us from the um, Central and Eastern Europe, the Baltic countries. And uh, we are very grateful for all the expertise and guides that, that, that we're receiving on this way. I will be open for the Q&A, thank you. Daniela, thank you very much for this comprehensive overview that the country did uh, over last year. I think we'll continue also with discussing that in the next session. Uh, just my feeling that from what I heard that basically for Moldova, Eastern Partnership is the EU and Ukraine to more extent than the connectivity of the entire region. But probably it was my like... Uh, just impression from listening. I think we will discuss that a bit more on the next round. Uh, Sevilla, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Veronika. Uh, also uh, wanted to uh, congratulate the organizers, EPC and Prisma, for uh, this very important 
uh, initiative and uh, thank you also for for the comprehensive paper long read uh, to uh, very very thrilled to 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 to, to look into the figures and analysis and uh, good morning to everybody and also uh, indeed it's not easy uh, to join in a, in a hot brussels morning uh, this uh, this early early morning discussion uh, I, I listened very attentively to, to what Daniela presented and uh, found sounds very familiar uh, to, uh, to, to our, uh, when, when we consider our agenda with the EU. Uh, basically, same areas of cooperation when we are talking about the pro programs, maybe somewhere we, we already signed the, the agreement you're working on, uh, on, the, on the transit procedure just in last October we joined so more or less we are moving uh, in, a, uh, in in the same direction in and, and the logic is the same to make more use of our sectoral cooperation and uh, eight trade opportunities joining the single market uh, to the highest extent highest and deepest <laughs> extent possible but the question is uh, whether Eastern Partnership has any anything to do uh, with <laughs> with those developments. So this is a big question, and uh, uh, kind of a standard approach of uh, our friends from European institution is yes, sure, this is happening because of Eastern Partnership. Uh, how comes? Well, very easy because Eastern Partnership is a comprehensive policy. You have budget there, you have you know, the political priorities, and because of that, you, you succeed, uh, or will, uh, will, will succeed. Uh, this, is, this is something you, know, you can agree or disagree, uh, but it depends on, on the country uh, you're, you're, you, 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 you're, you're considering, because for Ukraine, when Eastern Partnership was uh, commenced, it was 2009, right? And then those two main ideas um, of Eastern Partnership Association Agreements slash DCFTA and Visa Free were announced. For Ukraine, it was already something, pipeline, something the construction. So for us, it was actually no connection, right, with the Eastern Partnership. Rather, uh, to the contrary, right, that we, we felt that Eastern Partnership is going uh, to create a kind of a framework which will limit uh, Ukraine, uh, Ukraine's ambition regarding the next steps. And uh, this kind of uh, ambiguity is existed till the very recently. No wonder why, because okay, for for EU culture also, it's quite normal that that you 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 don't you don't have a clarity. You have a possibility to to develop the policy in in the relevant direction when. Uh, possibility or uh, circumstances allow. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you, the, the policy lack, for us at least, uh, lack this mm -hmm. vision and ambition. So it was kind of a constant struggle to, to make use uh, for Ukraine, I repeat, of, of this policy. On the other hand, when we look back what happened between 2009 and today, uh, yes, indeed, Eastern, uh, Eastern Partnership help uh, at least many partners, uh, not only Moldova and Georgia, uh, to, to, to move ahead and to get uh, European perspective, uh, but also I remember very well uh, the period when uh, we, we and uh, Institutions had uh, 
to dialogue with Belarusian authorities, uh, the Eastern Partnership was the opening for, for Belarus. Uh, yes, it was a short period. Then Minsk tried, let's say, to, to build up kind of a parallel tracks in spite of its close relations with Moscow. And that was the policy. Uh, probably it was also useful for, for Armenia in that regard, probably for Azerbaijan. But uh, this, is, uh, th this is subject for another discussion. So in that regard, uh, if, we, if, we consider, if we consider the consequences for the region, yes, there were positive elements and uh, uh, the, the policy also helped uh, to uh, to to keep uh, to keep on track many developments, uh, in spite sometimes ups and downs in the relations of 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 the countries of the given countries with with Brussels. Uh, whether it helped to develop relations between the the participants, um, I think. In the next panel, you, uh, there will be more possibility to look into statistics and, and the tendencies in different regions, because we are talking about these two regions, right? It's the Caucasus region and the region. Uh, on, sorry, it's uh, Ukraine, Ukraine, Moldova, Belarus. Bel Belarus, uh, it's, it's out of discussion now, uh, but probably there are more, more sub-regional dynamics uh, including trade dynamics rather than within the eastern partnership so we for different reasons we failed to materialize this ambition to have a kind of a stronger cooperation within six because of the eastern partnership why uh, well we will not spend much time to to, to discuss uh, you know the elephant in the room which is russian federation the influence of, of Russia uh, in the region, so it's very obvious. Uh, but I would like to mention um, one um, mention uh, one discussion or initiative we we try to uh, to 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 com contemplate a few years ago before you know, full fledged aggression started uh, against Ukraine. And the idea was to analyze how different trade regimes can function together within the Eastern Partnership. On one hand, market, and, and we, we always, we very often forget that Eastern Partnership is not only about six, it's also EU and the six. So we have EU, we have uh, associated, uh, associated countries with the DCFTA, so special relations with the EU, we have other trade regimes. So then it was more relevant to discuss uh, the, the consequences of creation of Euro-Asian Economic Union, uh, which uh, two of the, uh, of the participating countries belong to. We also had uh, Azerbaijan, which was connected, which connected to the rest of, of, of the six uh, through uh, uh, CIS, uh, free trade agreement, uh, and other agreements like uh, Guam, uh, free, free trade zone, which was at least signed uh, and entering into force. So we had a kind of a number of, of trade arrangements, and it on that moment, it, it was... Uh, uh, it was interesting to look uh, uh, how how they are uh, how they work together, how they are interlinked, and uh, not purely from, from the scientific or academic point of view, but from the pra practical reason. Because uh, for economic operators, it was important to understand where to locate the business, where to locate production, how they can sell their products to to to, to other countries from the region. And theoretically, uh, if Russia uh, behaved you know, in, a, in, a, in a normal way, uh, hadn't you know, done met and uh, 
went against Ukraine and not only Ukraine with a full-fledged aggression. Probably that type of analysis and that type of modeling uh, would have been useful. The, now, the question is whether it will be possible to get back to, to that type of logic in the future. Well, definitely it, it will depend uh, on, uh, on the developments on the front line on one hand, and uh, whether we have a stable situation in, in the Black Sea, because what, what Tom mentioned about the, the, the transport links, yes, indeed, we are working on, on, on those connections, but still they are under the huge risk uh, if, if, if there is no stability in the, in the Black Sea region. Uh, but what, what is uh, obvious today, and it's, it's already happened, that Russia lost completely its cloud, its, uh, its significance, and as a regional uh, center of uh, integration. Because some 10 years ago, at least there were attempts by Russia to, to, to create something similar to the European Union in terms of regulatory approximation in, in its own area. Uh, even commission was created uh, uh, using uh, you know, some uh, examples and, and the methods uh, of the European Commission. And people in the uh, both external action service and the, and the European Commission, they seriously discussed uh, possibility of interaction between Brussels and uh, Astana, right, in that regard. So now, now, now it's a joke, right? Uh, but when it was seriously considered. So I think this moment has gone. Whether, uh, whether uh, we will be able to discuss uh, seriously uh, this economic integration, economic, uh, not integration, but economic uh, models, uh, ec economic uh, optimization of, of trade, uh, customs procedures uh, between those different countries. At least we mentioned three groups of countries. So definitely depend on future development, but I do not, do not exclude it in the future whether Russia could be included, so even bigger question mark. But once again, uh, back to, to what Tori remarks about Central Asia, I see it, it, it quite possible, especially if we, uh, if, if we consider uh, the situation in the broader context, uh, and indeed European Union is getting more active in, in its relations with Central Asia, it is logical, right? And the Western route from, uh, uh, from China to Russia, through, uh, uh, sorry, through Russia and Belarus to, to Western Europe, also uh, now uh, it's difficult or, or not possible uh, to, uh, to use, right? So that's why the, the Southern route is getting more and more re relevant in that regard. So definitely, depending on the, on the on the development of the security situation in the region, I think on certain point we will be able to get back uh, to 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 the serious discussion about the the, the role of the Eastern Partnership in uh, in, uh, in 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 this cooperation, whether the shape of the partnership should remain the same also not clear, but it's not a principal point. So the, as at least on, in, in my part, <laughs> conclusion is, yes, uh, uh, the initiative uh, for Ukraine uh, had kind of a uh, ambiguous uh, meaning. At the same time, it remained relevant and it could have a future. Thank you very much. Uh, Sevala, thank you very much for this optimistic conclusion. Basically, it comes to what Martin said, that we have to be creative, 
thinking what will be next and the dimension of connectivity and uh, through uh, like interlinkages, maybe even larger region than we used to think about, uh, Eastern Partnership can create new uh, pushes for economic development and uh, potential integration. We are done with like, not very introductory, but like baseline speeches, uh, and open for Q and A session. Just to remind, I have for those who are online, please write in the Q and A part. So far, it's none. If it will be something, I will try. To, I will attentively read and ask. Also, you can use chart. I will check that as well. It's not under the rules but we can also please raise your hands if you want to ask questions and uh, yeah okay i wanted to say that i will ask but i first give the audience the opportunity to talk no no it, it's great because usually the role of moderator to start up discussion and we have it already now so the floor is yours no no that you, that's great it's it's no no stories you did perfectly well well, thank you so much for the wonderful discussion. And um, as I think you have all mentioned that the parallels are often drawn between the trio of countries that you represent and the other post-Soviet post-communist countries that joined the EU in 2004 and later. Um, so in, in the light, I think in with more recent developments in Georgia and the decision not to grant Georgia the candidate status, uh, I, I'm starting to hear these arguments that maybe the entire concept of membership has been devaluated as a result of this integration, uh, comprehensive free trade agreements, um, Eastern partnership initiatives, kind of providing or um, pro providing this um, leeway for both governments and people for the lack of a better word, not to be so desperate for the EU membership as maybe other countries were in the early 2000s. So my question is, do you think this argument has any rationale or it's something that just people try to pitpoint or put the blame on that, oh, maybe we should have left these countries to struggle more for them to be more desperate to implement these, um, and be more more desperate to, to, to uh, make the commitments and changes for the full-on membership? Thank you. Thank you. Can you also introduce yourself and for others also, please? Uh, I'm Petra Skivichuta. I'm a trainee at MEP Ostravtus office and an incoming master's student of European and Russian studies at Yale University. Thank you. Sorry. Do we have other questions? We can collect several of them. Okay, please. It work, does it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the discussion as well. It was very interesting indeed. Uh, my name is Anthony Gavel. I was a Blue Book trainee until recently at DG Near, and I'm a policy assistant there. Uh, and I wanted to ask you about the issue of Eastern Partnership specifically, because you all outlined very in depth how your respective countries prospect and like operate with the European Union and how they progress on the uh, on their on their path towards the EU. Uh, however, the question of the Eastern Partnership itself sort of remained um, a bit vague. So I wanted to ask, what would you say is the role of the Eastern Partnership for your countries? How do you see it in the future? Uh, and is it even needed anymore? Because all of your countries have taken their respective paths. All of them are doing quite well, uh, arguably, on that path. And the Eastern Partnership sort of stayed in the background. It doesn't, one of the uh, countries is uh, basically reverting back to a Soviet style dictatorship. Uh, two of them were in a civil war recently, and basically don't, no, not civil war, sorry, uh, a war, uh, and don't basically talk to each other anymore. And is there any point of keeping this uh, mechanism, this sort of forum alive? Thank you, uh, please. Hello. 
Yes, thank you. My name is Ivan. I'm a political advisor at the European Parliament working on EU neighborhood. And um, I guess my question is around the influence of uh, Russia and China in the region. We see China very uh, ambitiously, aggressively trying to gain influence in some countries, also in the Western Balkans. And for example, in the Western Balkans, that is the main driving force uh, that, that is triggering sort of political will to integrate Western Balkans as soon as possible uh, because Russia and China are making strong steps to gain influence there by industry and infrastructure and so on uh, and, and uh, gain influence also through disinformation and, uh, and various, various ways, political parties uh, through the church in the case of Russia as well. Um, and to what extent is that an issue in, in Eastern partnership countries, China as well, uh, and, and Russia? And, and to what extent perhaps can that be used to, to motivate the European Union and the USA to do more uh, to integrate the countries of the region with the West? Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Gennady also oh, had a question. Just... Uh, and okay, try to limit yourself to some of the most important. Thank you so much. A um, few questions on my side. Uh, first one, um, I would like to address to South Chinsov about bilateral track in trade, but still I think it's also something we should discuss maybe in this regional uh, concept. Um, about agricultural policy, common agricultural policy and Ukrainian impact. So is there a kind of comprehensive study, either on European side or Ukrainian side, what, should, what might be the impact of Ukrainian joining the common agricultural policy? Is it so grim when it comes to results, for example, that we could just destroy all this policy, that we can just make it uh, uh, ineffective and some, some, some from our Central American partners suffer from Ukraine joining this policy? I think this stereotype is myth, but do we have such figures just to counter this this narrative? Another uh, common question, somebody who wants to to to, to challenge this uh, about um, accession package of money and about Eastern partnership. As they say in European institutions, you have like common big uh, basket of seventeen billion euros, which like amplification on different money from from different programs. And you can use it while being part of this program. Uh, uh, is there a kind of shift between accession money when it comes to to, to accession process and your Eastern Partnership money, or how they could re be reconciled these two different uh, tracks of financial support? Thank you, and please pass to Amanda. And we will take one more question, then 15 minutes for answers, and then I hope will be another round. Okay, thank you, Veronica. Somebody already asked about Chinese and Russian influence, so I will come with the other big player, uh, Turkey. Um, could you perhaps comment on the, I mean, the role and influence of Turkey in the region, um, whether you see that as positive? I mean, some people say it can contribute to the Europeanization, actually, particularly um, of the South Caucasus, but I would be interested to see how that's perceived from, from the region. Oh, thank you. And one more question was, yeah, any any questions now? No. Okay. Then we, we stop here. I pass, sorry, I pass the floor to Sevillet and we move in the, like in the reverse direction, like ten, five minutes each. Thank you. Probably I, I will start uh, with, uh, with Gennady Maksak's question because it was directed. To me, and also try to, to cover uh, s s some of some of the questions. Uh, well, I, I think we will need to uh, to answer this this question uh, um, in the in the context of uh, our preparation to the accession talks. Uh, but uh, I, I would uh, I, uh, I see the answer. Um, uh, in the in in the following way that we we should consider those issues yes tension and uh, Ukraine potential which uh, some of the of the member states consider as a threat in a in a broader context because uh, if we narrow down the discussion to the agricultural issue 
what what is the price for the certain commodity when it's produced in Ukraine, what is the difference whether Polish or or Romanian farmer uh, whether Polish or Romanian farmer can compete, if not how much how much compens- compensation they need to get from the EU budget. So if we get into that type of discussion, we lose all of us because there will be a, a, a vicious circle, you know, constant blackmailing uh, from the gov- farmers against the governments and then governments against the European Commission. Uh, and it will exacerbate during the uh, election cycle, which is happening in some countries now. But if we consider this situation, I mean, Ukraine input right into the global food security, including European food security, I think we will find solutions because there is a lack of food on, on the market, right? And uh, there, is a, there is a growing demand in the countries uh, which, which develop. We are talking uh, about Africa now. We are talking about uh, Southeast Asia. So I think the, uh, our common task is to find smart solutions. How to use this potential, how to build up uh, capacities in Ukraine to process this food in the market, how uh, Ukraine also can contribute to the EU food security, because uh, if EU is going to implement fully uh, Green Deal in the uh, this agricultural part, I think the whole sector will be under tremendous stress. And EU will need to have a reliable supplier of commodities also for the European market. So I'm sure that we, we, will, uh, we, we have to succeed and to find uh, a good solution. Uh, I would uh, very shortly comment, uh, very briefly comment uh, on, on a few questions regarding uh, whether uh, Eastern Partnership is still relevant. Uh, I tried to answer this, uh, this question uh, in, in the beginning. And uh, the problem is that you do not a clear answer now. Uh, and I think our task is now to use uh, this this framework and the instruments which have been created so far uh, d- during last already 15 years, right? And try to adapt them to the reality, to our needs. Maybe we will not be over ambitious on, on this stage, concentrate on, uh, uh, on connectivity issues, on transport issues, on uh, digital agenda, uh, which is still very useful. And then situation allow probably to scale up and, and to, to touch more, more complex issues of trade and economic cooperation. So that would be way out. Thank you. Daniela. I'm impressed by number of questions in a Monday morning, <laughs> mid-summer week. Um, thank you very much for, for the interest. Um, about um, gradual integration, I think, would, was your question. Like, if this is motivational or it's losing from the enthusiasm. In the case of the Republic of Moldova, we are seeing only advantages of having a small, I'm calling them corsets of irreversible cooperation. I'm calling this FTA one, uh, which just in a couple of years, we managed to switch from one market to another, which I believe it's incredible. And also it allow us when we've been in our lowest political moments to keep the reversibility course. Uh, another example is NSOE, which together with Ukraine, we managed to connect to the continental uh, uh, grid, which completely changed our reality on energy, our negotiations power, and also finding solutions 
for the peak of crisis last year, November, when we didn't receive zero gas and electricity for one month. Um, we are interested in finding as many possible links like that, that gradually will make us irreversible cooperation with EU de facto in so many sectors. And also the Eastern partnership with our association agreement that allowed the flexibility to take as many commitments we could afford or are ready. Like one example is that like in our association agreement, we have the higher, like on personal data protection, we took the standards at level of EU member states. Even we need to sign an agreement tomorrow, they are no higher, like it's those are already there. But in other sectors, we have transition periods, like we, we, we're still far. And this is why for us, it's important at this stage to find as many other intermediate yardsticks of sectorial gradual integration. And we kind of, it's just difficult sometimes for a country which is still outside to say what exactly are those yardsticks. Like it's for me like never being in that room where there are the goodies for the like uh, coffee break to say what I really want first. I never been in that room. I don't know what's in that room. For me, it's difficult to say what exactly I would like to. And this is the challenge of exercise we're having now to really pick up and to say which priority we really would like to, to work first on energy or on this or on that. In some sectors, it's easier. And with our experts, we could identify. But in some, we still kind of need this interaction and cooperation with, of, with member states and co colleagues from the institutions. And we kind of very pleased also with the reference with the President Macron in the Globsec conference, where he was kind of already mentioning very openly about uh, this. And it's not about enlargement, about if, but it's about more how and kind of uh, finding kind of practical ways of that and different other references which kind of you're also following i think uh, as we do um about um the question about eastern partnership and how still it's uh relevant or specific toward us um it's again very linked with the first question in terms of like we're trying to take as much as possible in a pragmatic way in terms of like preparing us uh, in terms of homework, in terms of like tools and instruments. Um, but you already know, and also as our president announced, like for us, the enlargement is, we have a, a, a line uh, at the line of horizon, like 2030. And uh, it's very clear that Eastern partnership cannot take us fully there. It could only help and prepare till a certain stage. But then we need to shift from one side of the house to another in the... <laughs> Um, kind of com commission side from th this way. Now we're at this stage where we're trying to merge like the opportunities from both kind of policies and to understand better how the pre-accession funds will work on instruments and different kind of preparing for, for that. Um, I just had the last week 91 civil servants from Moldova in Brussels uh, doing together training on all these kind of aspects on instruments, on next steps, on financial possibilities, on programs, on chapters of negotiations, on all the aspects. And this is kind of trying, pragmatic and realistic to see what we can do from the current instruments and how we better pr could prepare for what would uh, expect us in the next steps. Um, it was a question about the accession package and, and money um, from, from your side. Um, we um, been helped a lot to to stay afloat uh, with all the parallel crises we've been facing in the last year, uh, and we are very grateful for all the support. We um, kind of what we see and what happened to us is that we are facing parallel hybrid challenges uh, and actions, not only threats but real actions on us. We kind of a little bit seeing that this will be the trend to continue. This is why for us the most important that the partners, the EU, the member states to continue to help us um, without not naming the instruments uh, on the current kind of state. But at the same time, we believe it's important to start discussion about like the the future instruments and how we could be included and in which form and shape in the future instruments. 
we are realistic and we understand that now it's very little room to amend the current instruments to really include us into the so-called IPA3. Um, we understand this uh, and this is why we are trying to continue to work with this economic investment plan within the Eastern Partnership to work with the Ndichi kind of potential. But at the same time, we're asking extra support in helping us dealing with the multiple kind of challenges we face. This is why the Moldova support package is really kind of uh, um, welcomed and we're grateful for, for that. Uh, but we believe it's important to have this type of brainstorming discussion in a maybe a larger, closer, smaller about the, the future instruments and also to have lessons learned from the Western Balkans. And also I think there are lessons from Indici and from our instruments um, and from the Eastern Partnership and even having summits as Eastern Partnership, I think it was an inspiration for the Western Balkans that they've been taken afterwards. And like they're kind of both in street with both directions that we can see for the future instruments, how we can kind of have an improved version. About the um, Russia, China, um, we have a saying in Moldova that like a chair, it never remains empty. And um, I think it's um, also when we've been in uh, different moments um, uh, in, in, in the past, um, we also experienced on our own skin. Um, I think um, also what it comes with the um, receiving candidate status <laughs> that we are gradually aligning and kind of the objective is to have 100% alignment to the EU policies and to your kind of foreign policy like CFSP and um, like uh, to, to the EU positions and to the EU uh, foreign policy vision. And um, this is very much also aligning with the Moldovan approach towards uh, kind of uh, China. And um, it's kind of coming into that. But again, I think it's very important to recall uh, that Moldova is very, very small. And um, even when we go and we try in terms of like big discussion to diversify our market and our, even let's say, for example, wine companies trying to have contracts in China, um, our contracts are so small, like we need to identify all the wine producer together in order to have a kind of a, a real kind of contract this way. The, the discussion is a bit is in, not proportional if you kind of talk about trade, but even about kind of other other aspects of that. About Turkey, it's our strategic partner. And, you know, we have autonomous uh, region in the country, which is uh, uh, Turkish speaking or Orthodox Turkish speaking kind of minority. And um, here we have a special link. And also it's very important to keep kind of the, the cooperation and the dialogue uh, in, in kind of uh, constructive and also to see the economic cooperation with this is kind of, we, we have a, a, a kind of a cooperation that's very important to take all this dimension into consideration. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll also try to uh, reflect on, uh, on the questions that had been raised. Um, I'll start with the question of the gentleman about uh, do we need uh, Eastern Partnership? Um, frankly, um, maybe you, you joined uh, a little bit later, but uh, like in my, my introductory remarks, as a matter of fact, I didn't uh, talk anything about uh, Georgia, EU bilateral dynamics, at least I have uh, briefly maybe mentioned it, but I have uh, tried to concentrate uh, my my remarks uh, from this partnership uh, prism. Because obviously, uh, just like Ukraine or Moldova, for Georgia, bilateral uh, dimension is uh, is a bigger priority and is much more important. And of course, I can also talk about uh, those 12 priorities uh, that uh, have been set to, uh, by the Commission or the Council to Georgia to implement, uh, to, to move to the next uh, stage or the implementation of the association agreement or the, the CFTA, or as a matter of fact, continue to open up every, every window or door that could be there, you know, starting with roaming and authorized economic operators and uh, ending with uh, SEPA, which is a single European uh, payment area, which 
uh, we are very working very hard on, uh, and we are, you know, from Georgian perspective, uh, we think that it is another very important uh, element uh, which uh, would uh, really bring uh, uh, our country closer uh, to the union, to the European Union in the sectoral way. In, in general, uh, sectoral integration uh, was a, always a big uh, priority for Georgia. That that was the reason why number of uh, years ago, um, we preferred to uh, establish not the EU Georgia Council, but as a matter of fact, um, uh, college to government meetings, uh, which would, um, uh, which actually allowed us uh, years ago to bring, uh, uh, to bring cabinet of ministers uh, and uh, have uh, a college of commissioners from uh, from uh, from the EU side, uh, heading headed by the president of the commission, to discuss sectoral integration. Because at the end of the day, of course, um, EU membership is about uh, being part of the single market and, of course, integrate yourself in in all sectors. Uh, therefore, of course, um, uh, bilateral track is uh, is extremely important for all for for all those countries whose ambition uh, stays and stays and remains uh, to be member of the European Union but uh, to go back to the initial uh, question and the topic of the of the discussion uh, you know about the future uh, of this Eastern partnership and whether we need it or not I did mention that uh, it had brought some benefits. It had certainly brought benefits uh, um, to the to the region from our perspective. It has played its positive role, but with the current realities, as I said, um, uh, we need to be creative. We can we have to come up with new new goals, new ideas, if we want to ensure that this uh, project, this program, stays alive and, of course, successful at, at the end of the day. And that's why I mentioned connectivity to be one of the big topics, uh, which definitely unites uh, as, uh, and is interesting to all parties. Because if uh, Eastern Partnership uh, stays as it is, at least for the countries who are represented here, it will not stay interesting uh, because it's going to slow us down. Uh, so it, it should change its focus. It should become more topic focused, particular specific topic focused if I if I can uh, say it in, in different words but uh, but in general uh, I, I could also remark on this that for Georgia even if uh, other countries of the Eastern partnership uh, who are not interested to, to join EU at least uh, in the, the it is not declared by them that they will be interested to join the European Union in, in the in the in the future. Uh, it is uh, important and uh, interesting uh, to have these countries somehow linked and engaged closely with the European Union. I mean, the countries of the region, countries of uh, of our neighborhood. We, we benefit from uh, EU-Azerbaijan close relationships or EU-Armenia close relationships or in the future eu uh, Belarus close to uh, relationships. Uh, I mean, even if they do not want to join EU today, but you know, the the uh, the more they are going to be closer to the organizations to which we aspire to get membership to, of course, better better for us. And in some cases, certainly we could also serve as a multipliers. I mean, uh, our success would be a good example to others. To follow, and I can actually tell you that there are some signs uh, because I we do have, uh, and I personally do have some information uh, that uh, you know some countries or some representatives of some countries do inquire about our future, how EU sees our next steps, uh, because they they are watching carefully, and of course uh, our success, as I said, could be multi can play a multiple multiplier role in that sense, which is of course also important and uh, important not only for Georgia or you know other countries uh, who are present here but uh, I I certainly believe that is important also for the uh, European Union um, when it comes to gradual integration uh, topic I, I would uh, align myself to what uh, uh, to what Daniela uh, spoke about of course uh, 
uh, EU, we all know that EU is not uh, a regular organization. I mean, you don't become EU member in one day, even if there is a political de uh, decision on that. I mean, you really have to integrate your sectors, your economy uh, with the organization. Now, therefore, uh, that's, that was the reason why, you know, uh, integration to the single market, uh, uh, in implementation of the deep and comprehensive free trade agreement, which as commission uh, colleagues uh, always used to say, once we would implement this CFTA, we would bring some core, 70% uh, of some core aki to our uh, legislations had been always very important. But now we are at the stage when we should uh, start looking uh, beyond the CFTAs, right? Because uh, we are we we entered the stage um, when we we start we are starting our path towards uh, gradual accession. Therefore, of course, it is important that we go beyond the CFTA and we go beyond association agreements and some of the visits, some of the discussions that we start to have with the EU. Not to go into the details are. Are, are good examples how we try to explore new possibilities. Uh, and as uh, Daniela said, would co where on what topics we can start and on what topics we could continue. But on that part, uh, I would also mention maybe one uh, one say that, of course, the EU accession takes time uh, and it's a gradual process. And uh, at the end of the day, whatever our countries do, uh, we do for ourselves and not for anybody else or for the European Union, right? Uh, but uh, now, I mean, in a way we are in those geopolitical uh, times when we also need uh, political uh, bold decisions. Um, and uh, because you either stay on the other side or you stay on the on this side and uh, those countries who want to stay on this on this side, I strongly believe that uh, EU should also be even more forthcoming in terms of taking some uh, some bold uh, steps and uh, maybe the the processes that could, in in different times, go a little bit uh, slower, could go a little bit faster because we cannot uh, lose lose time in in many in many ways. Um, on uh, on, on fine financial support, uh, uh, I agree with Daniela. Um, I mean, we all know that um, candidate countries have IPA, uh, so-called IPA, we don't. Uh, there are other resources that uh, EU provides. Uh, of course, uh, you, Ukraine case is completely different case. Uh, I mean, in terms of uh, financial support uh, and in terms of reconstruction uh, in the future. Uh, we have tried, um, uh, just like Moldova. I think we you know we had been, you know, in parallel working, of course, and uh, also consulting with each other on this. That, uh, you know, to to change uh, to move to IPA. But uh, as many of you would uh, agree and know, it is not an easy process. And uh, in in the remaining uh, budget cycle, it doesn't seem very visible that um, uh, that EU would. Uh, would move to new uh, move, move us also to EPA, but we should certainly push on that. And of course, uh, for the next term, we should definitely uh, join uh, join the others uh, in that sense. On uh, China and uh, and uh, and Russia, uh, yes, I mean China uh, had been uh, always interested uh, in the region. We know how they had been interested and active in uh, Western Balkans. They have been also interested uh, in our region. Um, um, I remember, I mean, one of the big projects that uh, is happening uh, in Georgia on Anaklia port, um, Ch Chinese, uh, you know, uh, relevant parties had been very interested um, in this, but uh, then the uh, government chose uh, uh, US partners, I mean, Georgian partner, which was partners the, with U.S. Uh, companies, uh, but as Daniela said, and I would 100% agree, um, chair doesn't stay empty very, very long, and um, um, the interest in 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 this region will, will grow. Uh, it should have, from our perspective, it, it should have been grown even before, but it will certainly grow because with Northern Corridor now more or less closed uh, or operating in a very limited. Uh, 
way, as Trevor said, now uh, b bigger attention is so to so-called middle corridor, and middle corridor also goes to South Caucasus to through the Black Sea, and center, uh, certainly the interest uh, will grow, and uh, certainly uh, we would very much encourage uh, our European uh, partners. Um, to be to become more to more uh, become more and more active and engaged also in terms of econ on that economic uh, front uh, to to fill these uh, these spaces so that others are not filling these spaces uh, on on Russia I mean we all know that uh, Russia never liked Eastern Partnership I mean it always hated Eastern Partnership uh, in fact uh, we would always say uh that uh nato no uh, russia was uh even though they would always concentrate on nato on narrative uh we always underscored that uh russia uh, was as against eu as as nato in terms of expanding and enlarging uh, uh in our region uh, why because uh, it, it was more about values than about uh, hard military equipment uh, uh, it was more about um, you know Western uh, values and principles being enshrined and uh, cherished uh, in uh, in in our region, threatening uh, Russian Federation. Then actual tanks also being brought uh, in the region. Therefore, uh, I do remember also there have been number of attempts uh, in the past when Eastern Partnership was booming. Uh, there were some countries um, in the EU. And maybe some representatives also also in some EU institutions who wanted to bring uh, Russia also in the Eastern Partnership and give them some kind of a role, maybe in the beginning to some kind of a projects. And Georgia was always very against. So we were always very against because we always believed that if Russia would uh, in any way be part of this uh, initiative, the only objective of the Russian Federation would be to 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 destroy it, and the good example to that is uh, the organization. Some of you might not even heard of it, uh, BSEC, Black Sea Economic Cooperation um, uh, Organization, where Russia is a member, but the only some you know function it has is to make sure that uh, the 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 cooperation is not developed uh, among, among within the region and among among the participating uh, country. So, you know, it is obvious uh, what role and what intense interest Russia has uh, in, in that regard. On Turkey, uh, I mean, from the Georgian perspective, uh, of course, Turkey is a very important partner. Turkey is a strategic partner of Georgia. It's immediate neighbor of Georgia. Uh, we have, uh, we are par partnering with Turkey on uh, many uh, energy projects, which also bring uh, energy resources from uh, Central Asia and Caspian uh, Basin in general to, to Europe, uh, you know, to name a few, you know, Southern Gas Corridor, TAP or TANAP, and of course, uh, Turkey plays an important role in that regard. Of course, uh, closer Turkey will be with the EU, better for, for I think, for the region. I mean, goes without saying, and uh, it's interesting how the developments now evolved after the and we in and after the Vilnius uh, summit. We have had some developments, uh, some bilateral meetings of between uh, Turkey representatives and uh, DG Nir, uh, DG Nir and uh, on, on also on a higher level. We have to still see how far it will go. Whether it really, whether it will really give a new breath. breath to this cooperation or is, is just somehow done uh, because of the decisions made uh, in Vilnius and it's a very temporary thing. I would not necessarily definitely need uh, a link uh, our integration process, uh, not necessarily, but I would actually not link at all our integration process um, with uh, and in European Union with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Turkey, but of course, uh, once again, I underscore that if Turkey would get and go back closer to the EU, the region, uh, not only Georgia, but uh, the Black Sea region uh, would uh, would certainly benefit uh, a lot. I hope I didn't miss anything. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think we had very comprehensive discussion. I'm a bit like 
concerned, we have a question from our uh, participant online. Can we still take it? Uh, I'm sorry, we, we were a bit five minutes late. So let, let's try to take it and maybe then a concluding round very briefly. Thank you. It seems that we lost him in the process of waiting. It was it was interesting question, but I, I think it's difficult to compare the role and influence of one hand of China and uh, and Russia. So if uh, Russia completely lost uh, its 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 significance and uh, in, in particular soft power possibilities in the region, uh, China. I will not repeat what my colleague uh, colleagues already said. Uh, has huge potential and interest, uh, but I think we, we, we need to, to consider this situation uh, taking into account the, the dynamics on the upper level. Uh, what I mean, US-China uh, discussion, role of the European Union in this discussion. So if uh, we all are lucky and there is a stabilization uh, in, in that regard, so there is a, a better understanding between, on the level of those three partners, how to cooperate together. When we have a better chance uh, that uh, China approach is uh, in the region, or, uh, China action in the region are less aggressive, and more fine-tuned uh, with with the EU uh, policies and. In that regard, uh, Russia has uh, uh, less uh, less chance to offer its uh, help to China to destabilize the region even further. So Russia today can only offer uh, its uh, possibilities of coercive action, not military aggression, but through uh, terrorist activities, through the cyber um, uh, uh, cyber activities, through the net network of corruption it has created during the many years. So this, those are the possibilities of of Russia today. And, uh, yes, indeed, it's a plastic moment whether Russia will will continue or will have to. To get out of the region of the region completely. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much. And our online speaker has come. Hopefully, he will reconnect for the next session, and then we'll continue this discussion. So thank you very much for being so active. You definitely deserve coffee, water, and fruits. So please, let's proceed in half an hour. Thank you.
Okay, shall I start? Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for staying uh, with us uh, and uh, and welcome to the second panel of our joint uh, policy dialogue uh, organized by European Policy Center and Ukrainian PRISM on trade and economic dimension of uh, the Eastern Partnership Policy. Uh, I will be moderating this uh, second panel. My name is Svetlana Taran. I am a research fellow here at uh, the European in the world program at APC. And also, I'm from Ukraine, and also I'm a trade policy expert at Kyiv School of Economics. And uh, during our second panel, we will have an expert uh, discussion uh, with our distinguished uh, experts from six uh, uh, Eastern partnership countries. And uh, we will uh, discuss perspectives of the Eastern partnership and uh, we'll try to find some common ground, some uh, common projects, sectors, and uh, ideas so that can uh, keep uh, Eastern partnership afloat. And uh, as was mentioned already during the first panel, um, uh, Eastern partnership countries demonstrate very different, very diverse uh, political agendas, European uh, and uh, European and trade uh, tracks with the uh, with the European Union, and also uh, uh, the speed of reforms. And uh, uh, but. Uh, economic cooperation projects of the Eastern Partnership, uh, they uh, provide some uh, incentives for all these diverse countries to uh, keep engaged and in return to uh, reforms. And uh, But still we can see that risks, uh, great, there are great risk of uh, uh, fragmentation and uh, disengagements within this uh, uh, policy. So, but at the same time, Russian uh, war against Ukraine actually has changed uh, uh, substantially the economic, uh, the geo, uh, geopolitical and geoeconomic reality in the region. And, uh, uh, we, uh, and also security situation. And uh, we, uh, we can see that uh, European Union has adopted uh, a massive uh, sanctions policy against uh, Russia. And uh, also uh, European Union is actually actively engaged in diversifying its uh, supply chains and transport networks outside Russia. And, uh, uh, we, and that is why uh, the significance of uh, this region, Eastern uh, uh, Partnership region, has uh, actually has increased for, uh, for the European Union as well. And we can see, uh, for example, uh, um, that the European Union is trying to be more active in the South uh, Caucasus region and trying to facilitate this dialogue uh, uh, between uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan. And uh, on the other hand, uh, these countries, uh, Eastern European countries, also have uh, interest in more cooperation with the European Union uh, in increasing it, uh, their economic resilience, uh, to decrease their uh, dependence on Russia, to increase their security, uh, economic and uh, military security, and so on. Uh, so there is a mutual interest. And uh, this, uh, uh, this make, these developments may create actually new momentum for uh, the whole region to uh, reconsider the uh, Eastern Partnership policy and uh, to accelerate cooperation uh, uh, among the, all these uh, members. And um, uh, so, uh, so this is like a, a we, can, we can see here opportunities, uh, not only challenges uh, because, uh, because of, the, of the war. And uh, at the same time, uh, one of them, I would say, big challenge, uh, it's a... Um, that uh, some of, the, of uh, uh, countries were suspected in uh, cir uh, circumventing sanctions, e EU uh, sanctions, and helping Russia to, or helping Russia to circumvent uh, sanctions. And of course, uh, uh, some, uh, I guess, uh, uh, 
uh, actions from these countries, I expected that they will not, at least not violate the EU sanctions policy. So all these issues we will discuss with our uh, excellent uh, experts. And um, uh, I will, I'm going to introduce them. Uh, so we in, here in the room, uh, we have Irina Huruli. Uh, uh, Deputy Director of, of the Economic Policy Research Center from Georgia. Also, we have uh, Stas, welcome, Irina. Uh, and also, we have Stas Madan, uh, Business Climate and CME uh, Program Director of the Independent Economic Think Tank Expert Group uh, from Moldova. We also have Sargis Hurutunyan, expert of uh, Yerevan Press Club from Armenia. And also Nigar Islamli, uh, head of gender development group at the Center for Economic and Social Development uh, from Azerbaijan. And also, uh, uh, last but not least, uh, uh, the, um, uh, Veronika Mavchan, academic director of the Institute for Economic Research and Policy Consulting from Ukraine. Uh, welcome, dear uh, speakers. And uh, also we have uh, um, online, yes, we have uh, Serge Navrotsky with us. Uh, uh, he's a vice president of the Association of Belarusian uh, business, uh, business Abroad from Belarus. Uh, um, now a couple of words how we will work, uh, how uh, we will run the debate. Uh, so I'm, go I'm gonna to pose a set of questions to all of our speakers, and you will try to address them in, in, in up to like eight, seven, eight minutes. Uh, and uh, then we will have a Q&A section. Uh, so please prepare your questions already, and also for our online audience, you can already write, uh, pose your questions in in Q and Q and A section on your screen, uh, and I will read to them. Uh, so uh, uh, let's uh, let's move to our questions. Uh, so my questions to uh, to you uh, will be uh, about the. Uh, how do you assess as an ex as experts the value of uh, Eastern Partnership for your country and your country's progress on the Eastern Partnership track? And you can touch upon uh, like different uh, aspects uh, like impact on trade, uh, economic resilience, sustainability, regional integration. Uh, and also, if you, for example, see the, the, uh, this track is not that strong, so what, uh, on your opinion, was the reason? What, uh, and what efforts uh, should, be, should have been done uh, more from uh, your government, national government side, or EU side, or both, on any other uh, reasons? And also, uh, the next question is, uh, what projects and instruments uh, have proved to be uh, of the Eastern Partnership, uh, have proved to be uh, more efficient and provide and or can potentially provide more value if they are implemented uh, within the framework of uh, Eastern Partnership, but not on the bilateral basis with the EU. That is why we will uh, try to, fi uh, to find out, to conclude with some uh, common uh, project and, and sectors where we can, uh, we, we can unite our countries. And also, uh, the last question from me is, uh, uh, amid the uh, Russian war against Ukraine, uh, what priorities should uh, your uh, Eastern Partnership policy focus on in the, region, uh, in the region right now? And uh, what uh, is your perception? How are you optimistic or pessimistic about the momentum, this new momentum uh, for countries to uh, intensify Eastern partnership cooperation in your countries? Thank you. So um, I would like to start with uh, Georgia in Moldova from the association, uh, association trio. Uh, as they have the high, uh, the high level of economic integration with, uh, 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 and also with Ukraine. Uh, um, um, Georgia, Moldova, and then Ukraine uh, uh, that have uh, uh, 
uh, high level of in economic integration with the European Union. And uh, uh, Irina, uh, please give us your perspective from uh, Georgia. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It's a great honor for me to be here representing um, Georgia and its progress on the uh, Eastern Partnership track. Thank you for the opportunity of uh, giving me floor the floor. Um, so to start with the value of uh, Eastern Partnership for Georgia, it has played, of course, an instrumental, instrumental role in bringing um, Georgia closer to the EU. And um, as a civil society member, I've been uh, tracking the progress that has been done in terms of in EU integration for all this almost 15 years. Um, it's a pity that uh, from the point of view of being a front runner in the Eastern Partnership uh, countries, uh, Georgia currently is lagging behind and has a backsliding situation uh, when it comes to um, taking the candidacy uh, status um, and being, uh, so, so to say, decoupled or uh, detached from the associate trio in that sense. Um, uh, the uh, two most instrumental uh, roles of Eastern Partnership are, of course, the association agreement uh, as a roadmap of reforms and development for Georgia, for the private sector, public sector, for the society as a whole, and, of course, the uh, visa liberalization. Um, thanks to the um, association agreement and DCFTA, the private sector has been able to uh, diversify its export potential and uh, getting closer to the EU. For example, in 2015, uh, the um, uh, almost one third of total exports were going to the EU, which was a great um, achievement at that uh, point. But currently, um, we've been uh, seeing uh, the backsliding in that direction. For example, just for the uh, five months of uh, 2023, we see that uh, share of the EU in terms of total exports uh, from Georgia now comprises uh, 14%, which is basically half of what was um, in 2015, um, also the share of CIS, the share of uh, Russia has increased uh, um, alternatively. So around 62% of total exports currently go to the uh, CIS countries. Um, uh, at this point, um, as you know, the role of uh, Russia in terms of uh, Georgia's economy, Georgia's dependence on Russian economy has uh, increased uh, over the course of the past uh, two years with a huge influx of uh, Russian migrants, with the increased uh, Russian capital in Georgia, also um, the um, uh, direct flights that have been uh, reconciled um, this year, so around... Uh, 200 flights per week uh, are uh, scheduled uh, from Georgia to Russia, which is quite unfortunate path because currently when everybody, the whole uh, Western civilized world is trying to decouple itself from Russia and from Russian dependency, Georgia is going in a quite a wrong direction um, in that sense. Um, and this is why uh, being part of the Eastern Partnership Bloc is, of course, important. Every mechanism and every tool that brings Georgia closer to EU is uh, welcomed uh, from my perspective. And what uh, can be done on the regional level, especially, is um, the uh, building of the, the so-called middle corridor, uh, creation uh, of more opportunities in terms of the, the supply chain, um, strengthening the um, economy through providing more assistance assistance uh, to the uh, SME sector as it is stipulated in one of the flagship programs of the Eastern Partnership because um, uh, economic diversification need to happen towards the uh, EU and more support uh, to the SME sector, the business sector is very important um, in this uh, process. Uh, if we look why, why the private sector hasn't been able to fully utilize the DCFT opportunities, it's mainly because of their low um, competitive uh, potential, um, especially low um, uh, possibilities uh, to um, be uh, closer related to the EU counterparts, uh, gaining getting access to more technology, know-how, and innovation. Um, so basically, low sophistication of uh, businesses uh, in Georgia usually also hampers uh, bringing Georgian businesses closer to the EU. So I think this is one of the uh, ways to, to work on, especially in integrating Georgia into the regional eastern um, 
partnership in European uh, value chains. And here I also can focus on the importance on the, of the connectivity in this um, process. Um, as it was rightly mentioned during the first uh, panel, this um, can be related to the um, reconstruction of Anaglia Black Seaport, which was unfortunately disrupted in 2016 uh, due to the in 2019, sorry, due to the political controversy and um, other geopolitical choices that the government um, has been uh, making. But uh, after the uh, Russia's um, invasion in uh, Ukraine, this topic has been once again um, uh, active, uh, has been uh, brought on the table by the government and they're currently searching for the bids of uh, interest and they also plan to have uh, around 51% uh, ownership of the Sanaglia Black Seaport. Um, when it comes to the Kutaisi Logistical Center, which was also actually mentioned as one of the connectivity priorities in the Eastern Partnership, um, uh, agenda. Uh, currently, Kutaisi Free Industrial Zone is uh, owned by the um, Chinese uh, companies. And here I can also bring in the Chinese influence and the role of China in the whole process, which was also posed during the first um, panel discussion. Um, the role of China has been um, increasing in Georgia, especially when it comes to the trade dimensions. Currently, China ranks uh, third in both uh, um, export and uh, import. So you know that Georgia has a free trade agreement with uh, China, which has actually quite intensified the um, uh, trade um, uh, tendencies uh, with China. Uh, most of the um, highway projects or large infrastructural projects uh, have been won by the Chinese companies, uh, among others, the East-West uh, Highway, which is also listed as a priority connectivity hub of the, of the Eastern Partnership um, strategy. And um, uh, likewise, it's important to somehow bring more European investments and more European interests uh, into the country. Um, however, um, as it was also mentioned during the first panel, uh, without uh, security, without democratization of the country, without bringing back Georgia on the democracy path, it might be quite hard to interest uh, European investors uh, to be more active uh, in Georgia because uh, actually the DCFTA and the association agreement initially was uh, also viewed as um, an instrumentally uh, important um, investment opportunity rather than only purely a free trade um, agreement, right? However, this part of uh, bringing in more European investors and investments into the country has not been materialized due to the uh, failures uh, on the uh, democratic path and on the reform path, which is um, quite um, unfortunate. Um, yes, I might stop here and be open for more questions. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Irina, for your uh, points. And uh, then we go uh, go to Stas uh, and to uh, uh, your uh, vision of uh, Moldova's perspective in uh, your Eastern Partnership. Thank you. Yes, thank you for the invitation. First of all, uh, uh, first of all, I, I would like to make a short macroeconomic intro in order to understand where we are at the moment. Uh, in general, uh, starting with uh, last year, uh, Moldova experienced a so-called perfect storm in terms of uh, need to manage different crises. Uh, first of all, we are speaking about uh, the, the effects of uh, Russian aggression on Ukraine. Then uh, in agriculture, we had a severe drought. Then uh, the soaring prices uh, in uh, energy market, uh, which uh, were exacer exacerbated by the Russian blackmail, and of course, uh, persistent uh, inflation of around 29% in uh, 2022. And uh, as a result, we had a GDP contraction of around uh, 6% last year. Uh, it's obvious that uh, all the projects between Moldova and the EU uh, we are, uh, we are uh, related in two parts. Uh, first of all, it, it was about uh, crisis management and uh, to mitigate all of the effects all, uh, of all these uh, crises, but uh, of course also uh, bringing uh, closer Moldova with um, European uh, Union. 
and uh, in, in in terms of uh, in terms of trade moldova is uh, heavily connected with the european union because around 59% of our exports are going to eu also in terms of uh, fdi more than 70% of uh, our fdi are coming from eu countries and also even in terms of uh, remittances because moldova has a large diaspora if 10 years ago two thirds of all the remittances were coming from Russia. Now more than half of them are coming from uh, EU EU states. And um, this, uh, this, uh, this fares only increased year by year. Uh, how EU helped us to mitigate the effects of all this crisis? Uh, first of all, in terms of uh, foreign trade, uh, EU decided to fully liberalize uh, our exports to European Union last year, and uh, they decided to keep this decision until uh, 2024. This was uh, quite important because uh, despite the fact that we have uh, this FTA and most of our products are liberalized, uh, we had some agricultural products which uh, had some uh, tariff quotas, and now they disappeared, and, and this is uh, quite uh, beneficial for our uh, for our foreign trade with uh, EU countries. Also, uh, another major decision in terms to boost trade was last year um, in line to to improve the connectivity because Moldova also was was. Uh, uh, part of Solidarity Alliance, um, EU decided to liberalize uh, uh, freight tra uh, transport, so our uh, carriers are not uh, supposed to obtain uh, permits in order to transit EU countries, and this is extremely important because uh, uh, for instance, Odessa port was uh, a, a very important uh, logistical point for our companies, and uh, Many of them were, were forced to uh, diversify their supply chains to build uh, new logistical routes. And of course, this decision was uh, quite important. Also, uh, en energy subject was uh, on our agenda, was a key point on our agenda. Because in March 2022, uh, Moldova together with uh, Ukraine did the uh, impossible, uh, which uh, before the war we consider this will take five to ten years in order to connect to NSOE to, and uh, decouple it from, uh, from Russian uh, in, uh, electric system. We managed to do this uh, in a few months. And this uh, helped us uh, a lot because uh, in last autumn, when uh, Russia was bombing uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, infrastructure, uh, uh, Ukrainian energetic infrastructure, and at the same time they were cutting gas supply to Moldova, we were able to resist and we are not left in the dark due to the fact that we are able to do imports from Romania or uh, without uh, synchronization to NSOE, this would have been impossible and uh, this was very important for us. Also on uh, energetic um, sectors with European expertise, we, we were able to improve the capacities of our uh, state-owned company Energocom and uh, to be able to buy gas from um, free market. And uh, also due to a BRD credit line, we, we were able to to build up uh, uh, stocks of gas and uh, on this way to bypass uh, Gazprom blackmail. And uh, also in the last heating season, Moldova did not buy any single cubic meter of gas, which also seems to be like science fiction two years ago. And it was a huge progress. And also uh, even in the last... Uh, weeks, uh, we uh, were able to fully implement the third energetic package uh, and um, also um, a very good uh, progress in, uh, in this uh, sense. Um, and um, last but not least uh, in, in the energetic sector is that uh, in the last heating season, the government uh, developed a, a major uh, program to uh, compensate uh, 
the bills uh, for, for the population and also uh, European Commission was main contributor to that and it was quite important in, in order to keep a minimum of uh, so, social cohesion in our country because the increase in uh, energy prices was uh, was indeed uh, quite uh, high. Also, in terms of uh, SMEs uh, sector, EU had uh, a wide range of uh, programs in our country, but uh, the most significant uh, fact which happened uh, in the last two years is that uh, we finally had an SME organization which is uh, uh, quite uh, compatible to European uh, standards because uh, after the reorganization of the Organization for Entrepreneurship uh, Development, um, the, the, the progresses uh, are quite um, visible. And uh, our uh, recommendation and our suggestion to EU is to narrow the number of programs uh, in terms of quantity of, of programs which uh, they um, invest in SMEs and uh, rather to concentrate more on uh, giving uh, the money through organization for, for ent entrepreneurship uh, development. In general, in terms of uh, financial assistance, since o October 2021, uh, European Commission together with European Investment Bank and EBRD made available for uh, Moldova an amount of 1.2 of 1 billion uh, Euro, and also uh, after Moldova hosted the um, European uh, the APC summit in June, it was announced that the economic and investment plan uh, the aim is to increase it from sixty from six hundred million euro to one point. Uh, 6 billion euros. It's uh, also uh, quite ambitious, but uh, our uh, main recommendation in this order, it would be to, uh, that this increase in financial assistance to go hand in hand to uh, creation of uh, local capacities in, in order to be able to efficiently absorb all this uh, amount uh, of money. And also, um, uh, taking in, into consideration the, the success of uh, organization for entrepreneurship uh, development to implement uh, to, to support to implement uh, the same approach to other uh, economic institutions uh, from our country which are dealing with uh, private sector like uh, for instance uh, energy um, uh, 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 energy efficiency agency or agency for intervention and payment in uh, agriculture and uh, also last but uh, uh, not least it is uh, quite important in promoting uh, this uh, all these economic uh, reforms to have uh, to, to have engaged also uh, uh, civil society organizations and uh, also to to support uh, critical uh, voices from CSOs because um, uh, for, for instance uh, all of you know that Moldova received the candidate status last year uh, and uh, in order to open the negotiations for EU accession we need to uh, comply with nine recommendations of EU. Uh, my uh, organization, uh, to gather, together with other two organizations, we are mon uh, regularly monitoring uh, how uh, the progress of uh, the implementation of these uh, recommendations, and uh, we are able to give some uh, yearly warnings to our authorities in order to improve um, the things before the deadline. Uh, Perhaps I will stop here and uh, we'll be glad to answer to other questions. Uh, thank you very much. But can I uh, just clarify this uh, last question from uh, myself? Uh, mm -hmm. It was about the project uh, that uh, uh, potentially are more efficient uh, within the European uh, uh, Eastern Partnership than, for example, uh, bilateral projects with the EU. Do, uh, can you name some no, ideas on, on this project and what can be done now? Just right. Uh, thank you. First of all, I would emphasize uh, in terms of uh, foreign trade. Uh, 
because uh, sooner or later, uh, Moldova for sure will exit from uh, CIS uh, agreement. And uh, on the other hand, we have this uh, institution of Guam, uh, where, where are participating uh, uh, countries from Eastern Partnership. And uh, after uh, the uh, last amendments adopted by the parliaments of these countries, uh, de facto Guam became uh, like um, a, free, a, a free trade area. And uh, we, together with uh, Ukraine, uh, Georgia and Azerbaijan, could make uh, more easily uh, uh, for foreign trade between us and uh, boost boost uh, our economic cooperation in this way. Thank you very much. So uh, trade is uh, the key for for uh, to survive uh, for the policy. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, then uh, we we are going to uh, Veronika to present Ukraine's position. Thank you. Uh, Sveta, thank you very much. Uh, I want to start from what is ERP and what is in the ERP, because definitely for all countries, the bilateral relations are the priority. But then the question how to place the association agreement, the CFTA, visa-free, the connectivity initiatives, including the TNT network and other like uh, ports construction, and many other initiatives that are concerning not one of EAP countries, but several. And uh, here is an ambiguity because according to the um, like official framework, we place anything that is related to the region in the EAP box. Uh, we place their association agreements and anything connected to the common trans transit system, anything connected to like mutual recognition of um, authorized economic operators, roaming, digital, um, TSOE and energy cooperation, everything is EAP. But mostly what happens, it happens bilaterally and then said that it is EAP. And this ambiguity that is generated probably by uh, European Commission itself, makes hard to say that this is bilateral, this is important, and this is not bilateral, and we, it appear. But basically what EAP gives all countries is something where we can discuss any relations as going either in parallel for different members, uh, like for different participants of EAP, or that can happen in parallel, or something that happens a bit of us between EAP countries a part of EU. Because another dimension that we have, and it's clear from data from actually the list of flagship uh, initiatives is that it's a, the EAP is a, hub and spike relations. We have EU that is so much larger, so much more economically powerful than partners, that the natural integration and natural projects, natural connectivity goes between EU and each of Eastern partnership uh, partner, a part of like uh, in between Eastern Partnership. And in between, we have so many other initiatives. We have CIS, which is almost dead, but still some, some things it gives. It has Guam, which is in parallel. We have also bilateral relations between these countries that are actually here. We have these ball of agreements, which are discussing that. But sometimes it's important to have this platform where we can talk about lessons then we have some parallel things happening, or if we have something that relates more than one. And here we have still EAP value, I think. Not in uh, offering in-depth integration between all of them, or, but offering the platform where we can step up slightly a part of just just bilateral and also money 
we just discussed that, for example, enlargement money will be available for countries in the next budget round, which is uh, by that a lot of our countries want to be very close to the EU already. And Eastern Partnership offers very specific projects, connectivity projects, for example, uh, for Ukraine, we have a Eastern Partnership has promised money for uh, cross-border crossing border points, which are now hugely important for solidarity lanes for everything. Which because we don't have ports, we as in Moldova, we need to move through borders much more efficiently. And there are some money there. There are some money for SMEs, not actually much traceable now, but still there are some like offered opportunities. There are some uh, other like funding opportunities for mobility. So there are opportunities that Eastern Partnership keeps, at least in this budget round, that we do not observe in other traces. And it's also the value. So, if we, what should be done already now? I think that what we have is what what's what we have. I think that uh, if we had already this discussion in the previous uh, round and also uh, during coffee break, uh, the dimension that EAP is not offering is a security dimension. And for most of the projects to be really realized and stable, is this dimension is it has to be here, because for example the connectivity, we have uh, now uh, Caucasus and uh, Eastern Europe countries basically connected through Turkey, but just because it's it's uh, in the both land route and. Uh, Black Sea Road are not fully secure. And we have so many other dimensions of security that has to be introduced here to, to be sure that we, we trade. So that's probably all what I wanted to say immediately now and I'm hope for discussion afterwards. Thank you very much, Veronica. Very interesting uh, ideas, especially this new, uh, I, uh, I guess, security issue was not uh, mentioned often today. So thank you for bringing this into discussion. Maybe we'll uh, discuss it during our Q&A uh, section a little bit more. And, uh, and now I, uh, I'm going to uh, our next uh, countries from uh, South Caucasus. Uh, and uh, let me uh, uh, give the floor to uh, uh, Nigar Islamli, head of uh, gender uh, development group at the Center of uh, Economic and Social Development from Azerbaijan. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Svetlana, for introduction. Uh, before all the uh, speech, I want to uh, introduce Azerbaijan a little bit from the perspective of macroeconomic on the occasion of with the uh, relations with EU and EAP. I would like to say that Azerbaijan is uh, situated between the, as Russia and Iran on the seashore of Caspian Sea. That's why we uh, have uh, a high dependence on oil, uh, I mean, that natural resources, oil and gas. So that's why we have relations with countries through the, that uh, topic, uh, oil and gas. So uh, we also have uh, trade uh, and economical relations with EU and EAP countries, especially EU countries, uh, through the uh, gas and oil projects, such as Southern Gas uh, Corridor, uh, TANAP, and TAP projects. Uh, especially TAP projects, because we have, uh, we have uh, relations with Europe uh, through Turkey and Georgia. Uh, because of this, this project. And the most important project is TAP project because TAP is Trans uh, Adriatic uh, Pipeline project. So we have a chance to get interaction with uh, e EAP and EU, mainly EU countries uh, more uh, because that project. So we have uh, some statistics on this, this kind, this regard. Uh, and Azerbaijan uh, has gas experts 
uh, to the EU increased by 5.3%. I want to uh, mention some numbers, some statistics, statistics because I, uh, I think that uh, this is, uh, the statistics are worth to mention because uh, if it's, um, uh, it's not so much, but I think it has a huge uh, potential for the further uh, interactions with EU and EAP countries. So, uh, and Azerbaijan has uh, agreements in the terms of oil and gas with e e EU. Uh, and we have so uh, events, uh, so we have some um, meetings uh, due to that, uh, uh, that field, that section, that subject. Uh, with a, a European Commission and the European Union and uh, with uh, the officials from European organizations. And uh, last year we have um, agreement and we have events meetings with uh, Ms. von der Leyen about the gas, uh, about the agreement on gas. We, uh, we have also, uh, we have the meetings on July. 2022, and we have memorandum of understanding in December uh, 2022, and all these interactions uh, are about the uh, oil and gas. But uh, besides that, uh, I would like to express that Azerbaijan provided 8% uh, of gas uh, import uh, to EU. Actually, EU's gas import uh, is 8% from Azerbaijan. And uh, it is uh, still growing uh, in terms of the shares. And, um, and uh, we have, uh, we have uh, another interactions with EAP countries, mainly Georgia, with Georgia, because uh, due to the gas export, uh, it's growing its importance in Georgia and uh, besides uh, EAP countries in Turkey. And Turkey gets uh, 5 billion cubic meters gas, and Georgia gets uh, 1.3 uh, billion cubic meter from Azerbaijan. And it's uh, the total uh, the total export gas export increased by 5.7%. That's uh, that's increasing actually, and uh, we have a tap project again. And we, through the TAP projects, we have interactions with uh, Italy, jo uh, Italy, Greece, and uh, Albania, and the Europe gets gas through this uh, these uh, countries. So, uh, and TAP can expand uh, in stage to further relations uh, to get the, uh, the Europe's energy security. And in this regard, Azerbaijan has uh, a growing share uh, in uh, Europe's uh, energy security. And uh, it is uh, stated that uh, Europe uh, can get, actually is going to get uh, 20 billion cubic meters gas from Azerbaijan by 2027. So besides that, we have so uh, other projects which uh, in the terms of relations with EU and EAP, we have uh, internal uh, meetings with EAP countries with our uh, our officials, uh, and we have uh, some uh, uh, reforms and regulations in terms of EU standards. Uh, we have uh, interest to uh, to get uh, to get uh, the relation to get close relations with EU. And um, besides that, uh, we have um, some projects that uh, in the framework of EU standardization, like green uh, transition uh, that uh, in Azer uh, the recent uh, regulations are about the green transition and green economy. I think that it's the most important topic for Azerbaijan in the terms of uh, EAP target, uh, EAP policy. Uh, so we have some regulations on the terms of uh, uh, prohibiting the uh, plastics and plastic stuffs, uh, using of plastic uh, stuffs and plastic bags, and uh, to pro prohibiting the cars that produced before 2013 as well. And we have some other educational uh, regulations that uh, that the reforms uh, the reforms uh, adopted by Azerbaijan government in this term. We have tangible and intangible. Uh, uh, tangible and intangible uh, indicators for the development uh, by uh, implementing the reforms regulations uh, by Azerbaijan and 
Uh, some of them are tra trainings, like we got the uh, training sessions from EU uh, for developing the economy, and we have some financial assistance uh, in this regard to uh, thriving the economy. Uh, for example, we have some agricultural projects, we have some educational and uh, other uh, that economical uh, sections uh, with e e EU. And uh, the main uh, topic is that the membership of WTO, because Azerbaijan is not uh, the member of WTO, Azerbaijan is observer country at WTO, and uh, there have the recent uh, meeting with uh, WTO working group, working party about the accession of Azerbaijan uh, that was in Geneva. And there, are, uh, there was a meeting about the, uh, the standards, the uh, further um, steps that took uh, taking place in Azerbaijan. And uh, for the next uh, working uh, party meeting, uh, I think that's, that's a lucky project, that's successful uh, meeting, I mean, that meeting. Uh, for the accession of Azerbaijan WTO, uh, for getting the membership of WTO. And um, yes, uh, and we have to follow some trade uh, legislation. Uh, we have to follow trade legislation and international standards in order to get uh, the, uh, the further steps in economy. And WTO membership, I think, is one of the uh, big and main uh, step uh, for Azerbaijan. And uh, we have some market um, access agreements with, uh, uh, with countries, like uh, the Georgia is one of the main countries for this. And besides Georgia, we have some other uh, countries uh, like Turkey or Oman or the United uh, Arab Emirates and the uh, the Kyrgyz Republic, and we um, have uh, economic uh, economical economic investment plan, which is um, uh, which has financial assistance for 2020 twenty twenty two. It was ninety uh, million uh, euro. Uh, it covers the uh, tangible. Uh, assistance for Azerbaijan because uh, that, that the, the sections are construction uh, and uh, building of the infrastructure in Azerbaijan. And besides that, Azerbaijan and EU has uh, 27 uh, billion uh, dollars uh, turnover, trade turnover. I think we have more, uh, we will have more relations with EU for trade. Uh, because we, besides uh, oil and gas, we uh, exported some other uh, economical products to EU. And I think it will uh, gain the more importance uh, after the, um, unfortunately, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. It will get more importance because of Russia has so many sanctions and it's, it still have uh, get sanctions by the uh, Europe and other countries, of course, the world countries. So uh, in this regard, we will have more potential to trade. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Nigar, yes, I think that uh, energy security is a very, and uh, green transition is a very important uh, topic, first of all, for the European Union. And we can see the increase in cooperation between uh, two countries. And uh, of course, for, for other members of Eastern Partnership as well. And I guess this, uh, Azerbaijan has a lot to, uh, to uh, offer uh, for, the, uh, for this policy. And uh, we wish, uh, as Azerbaijan is the first accession to the WTO because I was, uh, it, no, it, uh, as all other members are already WTO members, and of course, this would uh, make our trade regimes more closer and compatible. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, next, uh, we are going to Armenia. And uh, please, uh, Sargis, uh, uh, present your vision of uh, Eastern Partnership for, for your country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Svetlana. And uh, Ukrainian Prisma, the European Policy Center for this beautiful policy dialogue. Thank you, Amanda. So uh, this is uh, the current situation, uh, not bad, I mean, uh, for cooperation, deepening cooperation between Eastern Partnership countries in terms of economic cooperation, because 
in one hand we have uh, Russian sanction to Russian economy and uh, cutting off from world well, economy in terms of technology and economic perspective and uh, from on the other hand <clears throat> Uh, uh unfortunately we we uh, our i mean uh, countries economic economies of uh, countries eastern partnership countries are not fully integrated with european union uh, economy and so this is again create some kind of opportunity for uh, uh maybe for all six countries of eastern partnership region to create something new on economic field and because uh they are approximately in the same level of development and understand each other. Of course, in this way, European Union could and must have a decisive role in terms of uh, consistent assistance. I mean, expert financial political assistance to these countries and why not uh, assistance in security field? And we can see European Union, uh, I mean, uh, military assistance to Ukraine, but also right now we have uh, European Union observation slash security mission in Armenia and in Georgia, and this is also very crucial. I mean, for European Union new role in in, in this region, uh, in Eastern Partnership, and this could definitely help uh, to build some kind of new level project in this in this region in economic terms. Also, <clears throat> in June two thousand twenty one, European Union announced uh, two point six billion. Uh, aid package for Armenia for upcoming five years, and uh, men of uh, this money should go to SME development and road building. And in this context, I mean, uh, depending connectivity between uh, Eastern Partnership countries, building roads, building connectivity would be much more important in terms of creating new kind of cooperation between those countries. And again, in this context, European Union could and should have uh, a leading position, also maybe in harmonizing standards, sharing energy, uh, integrating markets for uh, those countries. And uh, in terms of uh, numbers, for example, Armenian uh, Armenian trade with Eastern partnership countries with Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, Belarus for uh, first five months of this year, approximately $200 uh, million. And this is, of course, uh, not so much. If, for example, if we compare for total Armenian foreign trade, $7.3 billion. Uh, and, but uh, on the other hand, if we compare, for example, the uh, numbers of uh, the same period last year, we have some kind of 25% increased. <clears throat> and this is again, not bad for starting to do something in terms of uh, creating uh, uh, deepen cooperation in economic, in mutual trade, uh, in, in the framework of Eastern partnership countries. Uh, trying to conclude my, uh, my speech, I would like to say that, uh, for example, uh, first of all, Again, uh, connectivity, which 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 is uh, much more important for any type of economic cooperation, of course, uh, in the region of Eastern Partnership, and in this context, uh, I hope that uh, uh, more uh, European uh, uh, engagement in, uh, for example, in Armenian and Azerbaijan peace talks, in Armenia and Turkish normalization would uh, open borders between Turkey and Armenia, between Armenia and Azerbaijan, and could create uh, much more opportunity, not only for regional countries, but only for uh, Europe and Eastern partnership countries. Where you could talk about uh, security uh, issues on Black Sea and importance of land roads. In this context, I'm sure that opening uh, borders with I mean, with Turkey and Azerbaijan, again, uh, it uh, could create uh, maybe decisive role in this context. And again, we would uh, arch more European uh, engagement in this in this region. In I mean, in in, in the context of normalization of uh, relations and uh, settling security issues in this region. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, I think it's a very important uh, issue that you touch upon uh, ab uh, about uh, restoring economic and transport uh, ties uh, in your region between uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Turkey. And uh, I, uh, we have some promising uh, news uh, uh, on this. Yes, we, we had a uh, high-level meeting here in Brussels just uh, several days ago. Uh, and uh, there were some uh, already agreements uh, and uh, that the European Union will provide some financial support uh, for, uh, for the region for uh, to make to make uh, this agreement work to 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 realize uh, to open these uh, uh, initiatives and to, to to materialize. So thank you uh, very much. And uh, now we are going to our online uh, speaker, uh, Serge. Uh, thank uh, thank you for uh, joining us today. Uh, and uh, uh, we, uh, please. Uh, uh, present us uh, your vision of uh, Belarus uh, um, a role in in the Eastern Partnership. We know that uh, Belarus was uh, has been suspended uh, from uh, 2021, but uh, uh, you you are still working and you still have some uh, ideas uh, uh, about Belarus perspectives in this uh, area. Thank you. Hi, good morning, Svetlana. Can you hear me well, everyone? Yes, we, we can hear you. It's super. Um, first of all, many thanks for having me here. Not only for my personal thanks, but also on behalf of the Belarusian civil society that we are still on board on the Eastern Partnership. And this is a legal um, framework that is still open for us regardless of the position of the self-proclaimed government of Belarus right now. So many thanks. I will be speaking not only as a vice president of the Association of the Belarusian Business Abroad, uh, but also as a senior economist of CASE, uh, Center for Social and Economic Research from Poland, where I've spent uh, 16 years already. Um, there are a few points that I have to um, mention and um, I have to start with my recent participation in Stockholm. I don't know if you're aware, but I've, two weeks ago, there was a strategic games, thanks to the Seal Society Forum of Eastern Partnership. We had a strategic game for the Eastern Partnership, and we're trying to see what are the strategic, strategic options would there be for the Eastern Partnership. We had all six countries present, mostly the, you know, the uh, Seal Society representatives, and I was the... Uh, in the economic groups, so we, we try to discuss and see what what changes could there be. But let me stop at it uh, on the on the on the, um, on the options that we worked out at the very end. But again, there are some moves forward, and uh, in general, total in general, first in partnership, as as we can see, it, and also for Belarus as well. Now I'll move to uh, various three very. Um, um uh, three very simple questions oh yeah and by the way the key outcome for me from stockholm was that none of the civil society organization none of the countries none of the six countries they were, they didn't say that eep should die everybody said that eep must keep business partnership should be there and this was a little bit surprising for me especially taking into account this you know the the, the position of ukraine and moldova and Georgia as well, so it's a little bit surprising. Now, there's three simple questions. Um, the one that you raised here in this, uh, in the in the title of the entire discussion: Can economy and trade keep its partnership policy afloat? Yes, it definitely can. Um, I'm totally sure that it was the economy and trade was one of the key driving engines in 2013 and 14. Um, you know, when the Ukraine and, and Moldova and also Georgia, you know, shaped the future trends and let's say this, this counter, counteractions against Russia started basically on the, on the larger scale in 2014 and specifically in Ukraine in 2014. 
So, and it is even more important now, I think, because, you know, we have done one step and we have to move to much more steps. Um, what EAP brought specifically for Belarus, you will be surprised, but, you know, we don't have a bilateral track between the European Union and Belarus, unfortunately. So there is nothing to compare, you know, if what, what is more important, bilateral or EAP. Definitely EAP did some positive impact on Belarus. Um, I wouldn't say that this, you know, uh, EAP was so much impressive and so much powerful instrument for Belarus, no, but um, just to show you a few very um, shocking figures to myself that uh, prior to the war, before February 2022, um, trade between Belarus and European Union and uh, Belarus in, Euro in Ukraine, it soared 70% in 2021 and even more in the first two months of 2022. So the, the, the trade was growing up despite the, the sanctions that were that were um, imposed on Belarus up to 2020. So this is a little bit surprising for me. And uh, the second surprising uh, and basically um, quite logical um, outcome of the Eastern Partnership that Belarus was included in the regional logistical facilities and lo logistical corridors. This is also an important thing because, you know, having the corridors from the north to the south and from the east to the west, it was one of the crucial thing. And um, uh, it was growing, and specifically due to this uh, logistical uh, change, the trade was growing as well. Unfortunately, after the war, um, it, it all went down, basically started even earlier. Uh, all this, you know, our... Um, our achievements for Mr. Partnership, they, uh, they, 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 they went down since 2021 and specifically all any kind of possible integration, any kind of possible trade options, they closed down since 2021. So the second question, does Eastern Partnership mean something for Belarus? I already started answering this question, so yes, it does mean. Look, you have to understand that um, we are in Belarus in the process of change. Coming back to what President Zelensky told about Ukrainian um, army, you know, we're not in a movie. We cannot change the situation in Belarus, you know, in a moment, overnight. It's not possible. You know, we have done much efforts in 2020. Unfortunately, we lost. But let's say, this was a first step in this, in this fight. And we have to continue. So we are in the process of change. And please keep in mind that this process needs different kind of supports also from your countries, from Moldova, from Ukraine, from Georgia, and also from European Union. I'm not saying that, that we, uh, we will win only because of your support. No, everything that has, everything will has to be done in Belarus, inside of Belarus, by Belarusian people. But we are right now in this process and we really need a little bit of support here. And Eastern Partnership is this kind of framework, um, support framework that, that will be important for us. So there are two kind of um, instruments. The third question, what could be there be for Belarus? So we have two kind of strategic aims for Belarus that we really need. The first one is for those who still remain inside the country. Um, why I say those who remain is because we think from 150,000 up to, to 300,000 people left Belarus after 2020. This is not a shocking number, but this is a significant amount of people, um, up to 300,000 people. Uh, many of them are, most of them are in European Union. So, um, uh, and but many people, many great people still keep in Belarus, still remain in Belarus and still keep on fighting. So for those who remain in Belarus, there are a few instruments to uh, within the Eastern Partnership framework that I, that I can recall. The first one is increasing mobility. I think it's a big mistake to cut off the, you know, the air, air transport, air communication flights from Belarus to European Union and vice versa. And also we have to keep on the programs like Past Plus, 
those who are for Belarusians who would like to travel from Belarus to the EU, because you know the the visa facilitation is also should be there in present because people have to be people have to have to come to European Union and see what's going on and and what are the other options rather than being with Russia. Um, investment in human capital development. This also should be there, and there are many tracks that that have been done already and that should be continued. I will be shortened without going into details. And um, uh, also investment in environment and climate resilience programs in the private sector inside Belarus. It's also a, a, an, an opportunity there. I know it's a very difficult. Some of them are very difficult. Some are very challenging just because, you know, you cannot simply transfer you know, money to Belarus. But there are channels. We, we, we are sure there are channels where we, we can use them. And a second strategic aim of recent partnership should be for those democratic forces democratic leaders from belarus that are now in the eu and the most important these actors uh they should plan their economic recovery plan after the democratic elections when this process of change is over so um eastern partnership could be such kind of a strategic aim you know a um a part of the economic recovery plan it could be a framework of options and uh, potential economic integration right after the reforms. Not only discussing all, yeah, maybe, maybe, but you know, um, it could be, it could have a, a very standardized and let's say um, detailed approach for what could have, what would have been done if the changes are coming. Also, uh, European Union has already been doing, and in many thanks for this, for its better access to finance for SMEs. But unfortunately, these SMEs, uh, this is the help for SMEs who are outside the country, who are who left the Belarus after the uh, the 2020. And uh, this amount is not significant; it's about a few millions, but still very much appreciated. And also, uh, the last point is to keep the investing in the cybersecurity and cyber resilience programs and digital government that, that will has to be done after the democratic changes will come. So we have to be prepared right now. And finally, my, let me uh, conclude here uh, with uh, the frame from Stockholm, what could be there for Eastern partnership country and how could we help each other? My personal opinion, and this is what also comes from our discussion from Stockholm is that we could come back to the regional trade initiatives like GUA and uh, try to invest in them and try to expand them to more countries, to all six countries, um, and give them more priority, give them more uh, free trade instruments, like very specific instruments. And uh, this, um, this, this cooperation within the, 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 the six country let's call it free trade initiative or free trade and democrat, 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 democratic um, changes zone could be a first step and very much important step in the regional security and regional trade. And of course, a first step in the more deeper integration for the countries which are not uh, in the deeper, um, which don't have the, the, the better, uh, the, the bilateral track with the European Union. Thank you so much, sorry for being so long. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, and uh, I have a comment from uh, Veronika. She wants to just reflect on your idea about the uh, free trade zone. Thank you for this idea. Very interesting. When uh, it's uh, thought provoking, Veronika has a comment. Thank you. Uh, Svetlana, Serge, thank you. Uh, just yeah, I want to comment, and I'm afraid I'm a bit pessimistic about that, because that was already Chinsov. Uh, several had mentioned that. Uh, what is free trade? Any country can become a free trade member, like establish a free trade, unless you are in a custom union with other countries. As we are talking here, we have Belarus and Armenia, which are in the Eurasian Economic Union, which is a custom union. So it cannot be free trade between uh, six EAP countries because it has to be Russia involved, which is not that 
Ukraine, for example, would agree for. But frankly, I'm also a bit puzzled why we need that, because we have already, each of our countries have bilateral relation, bilateral FTAs with each other. Then we have a CIS 1994 agreement, basically repeating that. It was actually, it was before. Then we have CIS uh, 2012, basically repeating that, and we have Guam, this is basically repeating that. In terms of the basic tariff things, uh, we definitely have more dimensions than just ensuring duty-free trade, which uh, we, for example, CIS, uh, why it's still not fully dead. My understanding is that it has a very uh, good uh, rules of origin agreement. Now three of our countries joined the EU, this um, pan-European Mediterranean rules of law, uh, rules of origin convention, but still we keep uh, CAS rules of origin for trade within CAS because it's even more preferential than diagonal accumulation. It's in the Euro, pan-Euromed. Plus, we have some concessions on uh, uh, technical barriers to trade within CRS. Uh, it's now eroding with the countries changing their uh, standards, but still, uh, this is not about uh, ghost standards before 1992 that had to be abolished, but it's about new things. So, uh, I, I like the idea of something that would unite uh, the three, six countries, but I'm not sure that FTA is a right and feasible, maybe not, it might be right, but it's, it's, it's a feasible tool now in the current political reality. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Veronika, for your opinion. Um, and um, it's a bit about timing. We need to uh, turn to our audience for questions. So thank you again, uh, speakers, for your interesting ideas. And uh, uh, the floor for the audience. Yes, thank you. Uh, please introduce yourself. Uh, you, you, you. We need we need Mike. Uh, where are the year? Uh, we need Mike. I'm sorry. Yeah. Hi, my name is Davila. Does it work? Yeah. Um, I work at European Parliament as an advisor. So thank you so much for this discussion. Yep. Uh, I have three questions, if you allow me. They're very short, actually. In this brilliant study that you shared, right, I wonder what are the reasons why Moldova was very slow in reforms last year? Uh, also, as many of you mentioned funding for SMEs, uh, I just wonder, do you have by now results of all these years of funding that's been channeled to SMEs? Um, one is to support SMEs to get stronger and to employ people inside the country. But do you have results that actually, what are the results SMEs starting to export to European Union? Because, you know, we've been doing this for eight, nine years. So do we have successful stories to share? And then um, for our Armenian speaker, as you mentioned, you know, the call for EU to be more engaged into these formats for peace talks and so on and so forth. And Armenia is starting to severe ties with Russia and you know, doing a bit more on its pro-European path. So what is your vision for upcoming five years? What do you expect you know, in this regard, Armenia-EU relations? Thank you. Uh, if there are more questions, we will collect and then the audience. Okay, then we, uh, let us address these uh, three questions and then we will return, thank you. Veronika, uh, you, Stas, or Veronika can uh, reply for Moldova. Yes, mm -hmm. about uh, Moldova, indeed, in the last year, the path of doing reforms was below our expect expectations, but uh, we have also quite uh, objective explanations uh, for that. 
because uh, as i said we, we were in sort of perfect storms in terms of uh, dealing with several crises and uh, our uh, administrative capacities were more uh, oriented uh, to uh, like to extinct fire uh, rather to do reforms because also uh, as I said, we were close to to be left uh, in dark due to this uh, uh, energetic blackmail from Russia. Also, uh, a few months, uh, all our government uh, was uh, dealing with uh, a, a refugee crisis because uh, uh, Moldova, even at the moment, it, it is in the top three countries with... Uh, uh, most refugee per capita, so it was uh, it was a quite uh, uh, a quite huge pressure on on our uh, public system, but uh, nevertheless uh, this year uh, we are recovering uh, with our uh, reforms and, and uh, I I hope that uh, we will be able to to reach all those nine recommendations uh, which were provided by EU in, in order to be able to open uh, accession negotiations for uh, EU membership. I, I can pick up on the question of uh, SME exporting. I can talk only about Ukraine and do not know other countries. Uh, before the full-scale Russian aggression against Ukraine, uh, the number of uh, exporters, about we are talking about goods now, uh, was uh, between 15 and 20,000, Was it was raising. Uh, according to the uh, statistics, Ukraine has about uh, 600 large enterprises. So out of these uh, thousands of enterprises that were exported, mostly they were uh, small and medium enterprises, uh, more medium than small, but still. And the number was growing steadily over the years of the CFTA implementation. So I cannot say that it was EU funding that helped them because they are talking about some always with EU funding, you have either very targeting assistance or like, educational training things that cover a very broad number, but we don't know who of them continue to be involved. But in terms of the general trend was more and more SMEs were involved in trade, uh, in goods. As of the services, um, IT boom uh, was obvious and IT are small and medium companies or even private entrepreneurs to many in many cases and uh, before the war I don't want to develop data but at least one third of Ukrainian experts of services were IT and IT was the only sector that continued growing experts of which continued growing during the war one of few in services, but the la very large one. Now we have some like, slowdown in experts, but still, uh, so we have a lot of cases of uh, integration. We also have the cases with uh, both refugees and the people who were displaced, who are involved in crafts that are very active on some micro level, being present on small craft platforms around the world and selling. So. There are definitely positive cases, and uh, SMEs are actively involved in trade. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much uh, uh, for the questions concerning uh, SME situation in Armenia and exporting European Union. If we compare uh, data uh, approximately five years ago, we have approximately 25% increase fields uh, uh, mainly agriculture and IT sector. I cannot say that this is the a result of only EU support to Armenian SMEs, but this is the fact. And <clears throat> uh, right now we are uh, we are keeping this dynamic and I hope that uh, during the upcoming years we would get uh, much more interesting uh, numbers result in this field. And as I said, agriculture, IT sectors, main sectors, 
concerning SMS, SMEs uh, trade with European countries, concerning security relations, Armenia with Russia and uh, European or Eastern countries. You know, for small countries, it's so hard to change during the one night. Uh, I mean, uh, it's security cooperation with uh, several powerful actors. So, but in this field, Armenia had uh, very interesting uh, developments concerning military and security cooperation, building new kind of military and security cooperation, for example, with France, in cybersecurity with the United States, and this is uh, after 2020 war. And this is very important. I, I talked about European Union security slash observation mission in Armenia. Right now, we are developing, uh, as I said, uh, security relations with, for example, with France, with India, with uh, United States in terms of cybersecurity, with France in terms of military technical cooperation. And this is very important. And uh, I hope uh, during the upcoming years, you could see much more European uh, engagement in our region, uh, mediation talks with Azerbaijan and with Turkey. And this could create some kind of new opportunity for cooperation in security fields uh, between Armenia and Western countries, uh, not only with France, with other countries also. Thank you. Yes, uh, also in terms of uh, SMEs, uh, also I mentioned, but also Veronica mentioned uh, quite uh, well in her initial uh, speech, that uh, EU has uh, some programs in order to support SMEs, or, but uh, it, it, it's quite hard to measure their traceability and uh, their impact. Um, that's why I said uh, in my initial uh, speech that uh, it, 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 it would be good to... To, to create uh, internal institutional capacities and uh, to provide uh, financial assistance for SMEs, mainly through uh, one, two, three institutions, which uh, have good administrative capacities, uh, good governance, and uh, also uh, which uh, could uh, keep their independence from uh, political interference. And uh, that's why, for instance, uh, in the case of Moldova, we have this uh, success story with uh, Organization for Entrepreneurship Development. And uh, one month ago, even EU um, offered uh, to order to this uh, organization in, uh, directly by EU Commission uh, offered the uh, 8 million euros in, in order to finance uh, uh, their state programs uh, for SMEs. And uh, we quite welcome this uh, approach and uh, hope that uh, this approach only will be extended. Thank you very much. And also, Serge uh, uh, wants to st step in. Uh, you're yeah, welcome. If I may quickly react to Veronica's uh, response, comment. I think I totally agree with you. There is this current legal framework that's not possible. It's all the matter of the future steps of the development of the initiatives like Guam and uh, let's say uniting the countries into, um, in, in, into a block that could be a first step towards a better integration with the European Union. Because, you know, imagine if tomorrow there's a change in Belarus, or tomorrow Armenian government decides to, uh, you know, to denounce some uh, some agreements with Russia. What do they have instead? You know, they have a very long track, uh, practically not specified anywhere of what should be the bilateral track in the trade options, in the trade uh, uh, relationships. And if you have this kind of first step in, like Guam, I'm saying Guam should be reformed, of course, it should be based on other, absolutely other standards in other uh, strategic aims, then you could create this political will for the future. Again, it's about the creative political will, not looking at it now that it doesn't exist. This was my point. And yeah, it was only one of the options that we discussed and one of the best among different options. 
Thank you very much. Uh, yes, very, very interesting uh, addition from you. And uh, let us uh, return to the audience for the questions, for additional questions. Uh, maybe uh, there are some. Uh, yeah, I know that uh, time is up, but uh, the last question we still can. And I have. Oh, uh, do, do, you want, do you want to uh, add something about the SMEs? Or? Uh? Uh, thank you for the question on SMEs. As, as you, we all know, uh, immense support has been channeled uh, through grants, subsidized loans, and they actually the, the absorption capacity of some of the specially subsidized loans has not really been that efficient because the SMEs cannot comply with the banking regulations. So some of the money is actually not being uh, used um, by the SMEs. Um, what I meant more was um, avenues for bilateral co collaboration um, among the uh, EU counterparts and also the Eastern um, Partnership uh, Bloc countries. Uh, but for Georgia, I would say that the clear impact was emergence of new uh, sectors so through the support of EU product uh, projects such as the intellectual services, which hasn't been on the table before, um, and um, increased number of um, medium-sized enterprises exporting to EU, but also more in being involved in the import substitution um, efforts, for example, rather than being the exporters themselves. Thanks. And um, before successful story, I want to uh, express the situation that Azerbaijan has faced during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, many of the SMEs uh, had to shut down after the pandemic situation, and Azerbaijan has still the impact of pandemic. But besides that, uh, I'd like to say that we, uh, in 2021, the, the share of SMEs to the value added or to non-oil sector uh, of to Azerbaijan was 13 percent, and uh, the statistics uh, of 2022 it uh, is raised by 4 percent and reached 17 percent to uh, to the non-oil uh, sector. So that's the I think the uh, success story for Azerbaijan, and uh, it uh, has potential to grow. And besides that, we have a financial uh, financial uh, uh, assistance from EU, and uh, it was the uh, support for the twenty five thousand SMEs. Yeah, that's that's all I want to express. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, are there any questions? No, I don't think uh, so. So thank you, uh, thank you very much uh, to all speakers. And uh, then uh, I would like to to use this opportunity to provide your uh, last word uh, to conclude our discussion for last words. <laughs> um, uh, with uh, how do you perceive the future of uh, European uh, um, Eastern Partnership and uh, what uh, like main recommendation how it can be uh, changed to fit in the uh, current context. Thank you. So, Stas, let's start with you. Yes, um, in general, um, you, you asked also about uh, common, pro common projects under uh, Eastern Partnership uh, countries. And uh, Eastern, Eastern Partnership is uh, quite adaptable to current conditions because, uh, for instance, uh, uh, in terms of connectivity between uh, Moldova and Ukraine, including with EU support, uh, we are progressing uh, quite well. We will have uh, a new bridge on Nistru River between uh, Moldova and Ukraine. Also, uh, uh, um, an old uh, rail railroad uh, corridor, uh, Basarabiaska Berezino, also is rebuilt with uh, EU support. And uh, what, what, what is uh, what is important in general? Uh, for uh, EU policies to to these countries is uh, to be uh, adaptable, uh, to not be rigid, and uh, I, I, I think that uh, we we could have uh, a good uh, progress, pro progress, but uh, also of course it depends on the uh, how, 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 which the. 
uh, how the world will, how the world will uh, end and uh, ho hopefully we will see the ukrainian victory and in this case i'm sure that we will have uh, a new uh, quite wide range of uh, opportunities uh, to explore between uh, mm -hmm. eastern partnership countries thank you and varenika uh yeah thank you i agree with stas basically uh, our region is now under perfect storm i'm not sure only in moldova everywhere and a lot will depend in there with the how the war ends, I definitely sure that the war ends with the victory of Ukraine. The question is when, and it's it's very important to be sh to have it as soon as possible. So the role of EU should be a, a both financial and especially military support should be really high to ensure that we have some definite solution. These are and as soon as we have a bit higher certainty in the security dimension and more clarity how how we develop, then I think there will be much more opportunities for the EAP uh, data integration because uh, we have this like security uh, um, strategic certainty now for uh, Ukraine and Moldova that got the candidate status. Hopefully we'll still have also some time dimension here not only eventually, but when, uh, but also we, I hope that uh, Georgia will, will get this clarity much sooner. And I hope that the other three countries also will uh, integrate closer uh, as soon as we have clarity. So there we have a huge if or when, and then we, we can plan for much brighter future, I hope. Thank you very much, Sengis. Uh, yeah, thank you. And I just want to add that we should uh, keep small steps. Uh, we we couldn't uh, we couldn't expect that uh, we 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 can provide immediate I mean results in this regard. And for example, I agree with our Belarusian colleagues that uh, we 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 could we could keep small smets in, in regard of concerning uh, economic cooperation. Yes, uh, we are, our countries on different situations, Armenia, Belarus, Azerbaijan, uh, Georgia, etc., Ukraine, Moldova, but we can, I mean, uh, we can keep small steps towards economic cooperation, towards creating something common in this field, in this, I mean, Eastern, uh, partnership region and uh, yes, this is very important. Thank you. Thank you, Irina. Just to join the colleagues, um, I also wish for uh, more clarity in the region, uh, resolution of uh, conflicts and of war in um, Ukraine. And this will, of course, give more clarity towards the path that we can be uh, taken, be taking because currently we are in very turbulent and uh, hard to predict uh, environment. Thank you. Thank you. And I you want better. to add something. Uh, it will be the forecast for the future in the terms of the relations with, between uh, among Azerbaijan, Georgia and Armenia. Uh, as if the, the re reopening of the trans uh, communications and transportation between Azerbaijan and Armenia, it will give uh, added uh, economic growth to, to GDP, uh, that 1.80% uh, economic growth to Azerbaijan, 1.74 Georgia, and uh, 2.5 uh, economic growth to GDP for Armenia. That's why we, uh, uh, let's say we are hope for the future for the uh, peace agreement. So we can get, uh, actually, we all can get benefit from uh, this, uh, you know, the negotiation, these interactions. So I, I want to say thank you for everything. That's all. Thank you very much for this optimistic uh, view uh, that the in can be beneficial for everyone. Thank you. And, uh, ah, sir, sir, yes, and Serge, sorry. <laughs> Serge, your final yeah, Sorry, word. sorry I you. cannot be present with you today. I will be very fast. Uh, no for more approach in Eastern Partnership uh, doesn't exist. It, it's not the case anymore, but Eastern Partnership should be there, that's for sure, and it should be reformed. Uh, before that, we all have to understand that no Eastern Partnership is possible unless Ukraine wins the war. 
And we all have to do much as much as we can to help them win this war. So good luck and Slava Ukraine. Thank you very much for your position. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.